Welcome back everyone to episode 9 of the Guangdong State Sony Run China TNO with lots of words in TNO for the Holy 4 mod uh, for Hearts of Iron 4. But uh, I'm your host, Mr. 1949 Part 2 Lover. Crisis. The morning paper's arrival, Lan was sitting down with the client, a heavy downpour crashing down on Kowloon. The paper board drenched from range gruffly and put the papers down on his desk and rushed out again with an umbrella. Immersed in the conversation, Lamb did not take a second glance at the bundle until he noticed it at the corner of his vision. Excuse himself, his old bold typeface proclaimed a new horror that was about to freeze his blood in his veins. Prime Minister announced the creation of a new state, the first uh, line read. Its subtitle did not offer much in the way of consolation, Guangdong to be a new Manchuria. The headline went on. Exercise in Pan-Asianism, continue on page 12. Gosh darn it, Lamb thought. Gosh darn it all. Just as the firm was getting started, he flipped through the newspaper and read the first lines, first couple lines in the febrile panic. Or in febrile panic. So what's you got so got you so rattled? The client asked, noticing the feverish edge into Lamb's eyes. I, Lamb refolded the newspaper and showed the headline to the client. I'm sorry, sir, but can we arrange for another meeting for another time? The client looked at Lamb as if he was curious, a curious, otherworldly Harlequin. Then he burst into a nervous giggle. No, he said, reassuring, reasserting control over himself. There'll be nothing to talk about. My business is. They all need hands on all need all hands on deck for the days ahead. I hope, Mr. Lamb, that you will allow me this impoliteness. He stood up and ran. Soon, Lamb himself was on the streets. His sheep suit drowning in rain. Then he saw throngs of people from firms just as like his as they dashed to catch the fleeting taxis that led out from Kowloon to the financial district in downtown Hong Kong. Fleeting feet hurried to escape the inescapable. So 65% is not bad. Average is okay. Uh, yeah, like I said in the end of the last episode, it's not going to be great for us for this one. We have 20 days left and like no, nothing really. Uh, it's not good. If we could wait this one, this would be 5 days for 5. Or just spend it now and get 5. If we wait 10 days... We can still get this one for 10% more, which is not bad, just not great. Um, there's also test productivity up there as well, so... Yeah. Oh. So we can do this one, and we will. But that really, really freaking sucks. No, we're just not going to do as well. There's nothing we can do about it. Oh. Show product release. We can launch a Ford. A little more profitability, but that's 10 days. We can decrease it by 20%, but then 20% interest just goes down. We don't have the political power for that. You might as well just release it whenever it d does release. Body purity control. Uh, Marita Akeo and Li Kaxing, uh, both dressed in lab coats, took a look at the results of the first rounds of river water tests as the scientists fussed over the implements and cleaned up the laboratory. Reading the results with interpretive notes provided by the chief scientist, they wanted to vomit. The water was disgustingly filthy, a myriad of biological contaminants of countless types, sizes, and toxicities. Trace fecal matter, urea, uh, germs, bacteria, and all the poisons that sprung to birth from the tremendous beautiful earth. Then there were various poisonous chemical compounds in the water, too. Things like perchlorethylene and chloroform. Ooh. Worst of all, there was no small tr of trace metals, lead, cadmium, cadmium, mercury, you name it. They had no place in any water, let alone the waters of the Pearl River. Lee's face almost green forced his words out. You realize, don't you, okay, that a good chunk of the population not being able to afford the imported waters instead of forced to drink this this, this filth? Marina saw his friend stay and decided to try to quip uh, to improve his mood. Maybe we made everyone's tea out of this water, then even the Burgundian good-for-nothing Komai would back us up on this. Lee lost his mind laughing, and Marita joined him. The smokestacks quit smoking. In the modern age, the primary issue of industrial smog is quite simple to mitigate using the right technologies, filters, and efficient design. All these are, however, quite expensive, and in the past, corporations have preferred to be cheap instead of clean. That ends now. We'll set new standards for all others to follow, requiring them to purchase the necessary equipment and keep the air that employees breathe clean and healthy. So as right now, even though we're really focused on that, we still have 53 seats. So, that's not bad. We might get one more Sony seat, more support, and increase more support. Lots of support, maybe. I think we're going to collapse this. 10 days left. Well, at least we're off great and high. It's not great. There's really much else we can do about it at this point, you know. Is this five days? We can get five five more. Okay, so that's the last one we can do. You know, like I said in the last video, I knew we weren't going to do great on that one. Also, how are we looking here? We're looking actually pretty decent. I don't want to get involved in here now because like the supplies are just so bad. Hey, advancements in power and efficiency technology. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Not bad. And now it's September 1st. Happy September 1st, everybody. I think my light bulbs are brighter now. Cool. Very cool. So, sorry to the Turkish markets, but it is what it is for now. Corruption, we need to cu keep cutting you down. Approval's very good, though. The DR4A. 
Um, with the rise of the home stereos, it's not uncommon to hear music blasting out of apartment buildings late in the night. For those of a more reserved nature who would fear drawing the ire of the neighbors, Sony's new DR4A headphones allow music to be enjoyed in the complete privacy. Fully enclosed headphones provide excellent sound quality while ensuring that the only the wearer hears anything, allowing them to be fully absorbed in the music without outside distractions and to listen to any genre of music without embarrassment or annoyance. It's especially valuable in divided societies like Guangdong, where playing Cantonese music in a Japanese neighborhood or vice versa carries a serious social stigma. Keep the tunes to yourself. So, uh, reach average of 65%. A lot of profitability, though. We still get more, more seat. And our growth is over not bad. A miscellaneous income isn't as good as what it used to be, but it's not bad. We do get the, to revive the dead as well. Oh, and Africa has done darn exploded. But, uh, you know what? I'm only talking over this because it might end up, uh... Oh. Well, I guess just not Africa exploded. So did France. What? Did they... Did they explode harder? Down on... Maybe not. There's that handsome guy, too. French Civil War. Nothing like Africa and France exploding at the same time. Investment focus research? Yeah, we'll probably still do that one. Um, still gonna do stuff up here as well. So we're working on getting back control over here, too. So, uh, right now, oh, oh, a little less than half, which is not great, but that's doing a lot better. Zuzu support is actually at 65%. That's pretty decent, though. To revive the dead, though, the first chord entered, uh, and the crack emanated as the machine came to life. Adnan's ears were pierced by the screeching of the machines, and after a few moments of tampering with the dials, he managed to get the buzzing to halt. The noise gave way to silence before suddenly roaring to life once more. How happy is the one who says I am a Turk? Adnan jumped and clapped with glee. The Sunni amplifier sent directly to the small party office in Tunsili. For the CPH, CHPs, HQ, and Ankara, they had arrived late. And he spent the last hour of his ship fidgeting with cables in an attempt to unscrabble the machine's function. But he finally done it to a stunning result. The sound was so pristine that he was taken aback. Without done, he left the office, marching back home to rest for the day after exhausting an tiresome shift. As the morning came anew, Adnan woke to the city abuzz with conspiracy. He passed by his neighbor, Simal, a bearded man whose build seemed intimidating were not for his passionate eccentricity, with a new legend to tell for each day. Some were amusing, some were nonsensical, but Adnan would always listen. Today's legend struck him as a, a, extraordinarily odd, even when compared to the rest. Simal told him that the Ghazi was still alive, headed somewhere here in the Tunseli, and his voice could be heard emanating within the city. Adnan laughed and carried on with his structure work, but to his surprise, a small party office in Tunseli that sat isolated and undisturbed within the city's exterior was now surrounded by a sea of men. The truth suddenly came to him. They had forgotten to unplug the amplifier last night, and the sheer quality of sound had delighted many into believing Ataturk himself was now walking among them. With a gleeful smile forming on his face, Adnan took to the masses to clear the, the misconceptions. We cannot revive the gods, but we will forever carry his ideals. The Public or Health Ordinance Stopgap efforts to combat the various health crises in Guangdong simply cannot increase the overall quality of health without a concerted and focused effort across multiple governmental departments. However, the only way to expand the power of the government enough is to accomplish this in a contract of dedicated companies to address the issue if necessary lies through the Legislative Council. It's actually looking really good. Ah, oh, we're called 1955, July. Marita's mind reeled in shock as he digested the contents of the letter Lee handed him over once they were alone in Lee's office. The contents were shocking, but not as much as the name in the bottom, handwritten in black ink beside a blood red personal seal. Um, Ibuka Masaru. Uh, patent infringement. That's BS, Lee said, too cheerfully to be entirely natural. How oh, can we infringe on a patent they registered after the TR 56 launch? We'll ignore it, and if Fujita takes us to court, we'll pay a fine. That's his personal seal, Morita muttered, fighting to keep his hands from ripping the paper apart. This isn't just some corporate legal paperwork. He's here in Guangdong, so it's personal. There's one thing he's always hated was people taking credit for what was his idea. Marita tossed the letter onto Lee's desk with a frazzled sigh. Here comes. He's he come here for one purpose, to put us out of business. Lee bit his lip. If Ibuka was as relentless as Marita made him out to be, then he'd have to do was slip enough cash into the presiding judge's pocket and have his verdict. Legal specifics be darned. And it wouldn't even take all that much either. A Chinese company in Guangdong would draw the short stick by default. But even if it were to take it into court, the TR-56 would still be available pending a final verdict, selling to their untapped Chinese audience. A ghost of a smile formed on Lee's lip, but they were looking for publicity now. Imagine what a court case properly marketed could do. Oh, they actually recognize the Omsk government, huh? So this tune is really weird. It's look on dreams. I kind of like it, though. It's very, it's very simple, but... Uh, the situation improved. A family downwind from a factory in rural Guangdong noticed that the air was cleaner for the once in their lives. Part of that may have been because of the smoke stacks from the nearby factory had stopped smoking nearly as much. The grandfather said it hadn't been like this since the days of the old republic when Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek fought among each other for control of the nation, not concerning themselves with the terrible threat to the east. 
People are to go to the daily business to work, for groceries and so on, without being winded, or running out of breath, or having to go on a prolonged rest. The family felt unmitigated joy seeing this, until one of their neighbors, an older gentleman, began to cough up blood uncontrollably under the treats, like he used to back when the skies were dirtier. Though things were improving, alas, that improvement came too late for many, and the medical care was still vastly insufficient. So the family tempered their enthusiasm and moved on. One takes what good one can get. So, so let's take a look-see here first. So we have 51 votes still. Awesome. So if that's the case, we're still going to continue pushing on with even more speed if we can. And after that, we're going to go do with more control over this area here, up here. Even though we do want more, um, Matsushita's offer. Uh, uh, Morito watches Li Kaoshing, Stanley Ho, and Omori Khan filed out of his office at the end of the weekly cabinet meeting, delivering a pointed stare at Matsushita Masaharu, who remained dead in his chair, or I mean, seated in his chair. What can I do for you, Morita said, of forcing a congenial tone? The public health ordinance, Matsushita replied, keeping his voice even, is a disaster for businesses, and you know that. A disaster, Morita asked incredulously. I wasn't aware that a smuggy skies and bodies hanging from nets was normal. That's a cheap exaggeration, and you know it, Matsushita snapped back. We need more time along a consultation period, at the very least. Otherwise, what am I supposed to say to the investors in Tokyo when they say you're running out of raw shit over them? Or running rough, rough shit over them? Tell them that what we're being, what's being proposed is no different than what they had to put up with in Tokyo, Morita replied. If we can deal with it, so can they. Look, it's your ordinance, and I'm sure you'll find the support somewhere, Matsushita stood up to leave. But don't come crying to me, the Japanese investors start running for the hills. I gave you a fair warning. Wait, you have a point. Nope. We could, or we'd save the political power. It might just be best to save it. Because we do need to just cut down. Bribe our own? No. So to that, then we'll go with, like we said in the last video, we're going to go with dignity next. Now, how do you reward someone who gives their body, time, and freedom to do their job? Lee Kashyyyk believes that the fa- After simple, pay, just pay them more. To give people the recognition for their labor and doing so, to give them the first means to their self-emancipation. Lee acknowledges that his meteoric rise in Guangdong's corporate politics, clawing his way out of poverty, was a product of sharing the profits eked out by his partnership with Morita. Even if the majority of workers will never become capitalists themselves, it's not unreasonable to ensure that the masses are able to live off of the labor they provide, to clothe themselves in the dignity of work. We have 48 seats, that's actually really good. Uh, Bribe Fujitsu. The uh, man standing before Chief Executive Morita Kale had taken care to disguise their affiliations, with some arriving hours before their scheduled appointment, and others darting into the comp government complex seconds before their designated time. Nobody wore the lapel pens over the hallmark of any self respecting corporate executive. Morita Akeo didn't need to see the pins anyway. The manner of their arrival made it clear that they were from a company out of the good graces of the government, since Hitachi would scarcely agree willingly to anything so if he had to offer only that one left one option, Fujitsu. Uh, Morita Akeo suppressed a smile as he watched the company's suits stumble through their opening remarks, their obsessiveness. Obsessiveness. A far cry from the rancor and self assured Ibuka, who they represented, was indication enough that they were prepared to be swayed of Morita Akeo's side in the Legislative Council. We would, of course, require some consolidation of the difficulties of taking the step. You understand, of course. Morita Akeo's eyes now, just because they were prepared for a suede, didn't mean that they wouldn't ask for anything in return, a plane ticket back to Japan, so in special consideration for a factory on construction, or a briefcase of uh, stuff full of cash, that was after all business was done. Oh, uh, we don't need them. We really don't. Desperate measures in Legco. The shrill ringing of the telephone came as a shock, jolting Morita's attention away from his papers. At this hour, with everyone else on the executive's floor having retired for the night, there could be no good news. Yes, Marita spoke tersely, hoping that this was simply a case of a misdialed number. A chief executive. The boys on the line dispensed with Marita's hope with a single breath. While refusing to name themselves in turn, I have a proposal. Who is that? Uh, a Morita barked. Who do you work for? Uh, who I am doesn't matter, the voice growled. But the men I represent are prepared to defy our standing's instructions to, le to lend you no assistance in the legislative council. So attach you, thought Marita. Matsushita or Ibuka's men would be unafraid of asking favors openly. We have certain transactions we're looking to conduct away from the scrutiny of our employer, or, the, or of the revenue authorities. For that matter, the voice said on terms, it's, that is our price, and what if I refuse? Then we have nothing more to speak of. If you want a cooperation, then call me back. The line went dead. Forget about the conversation. This for measures? Increase the Hitachi seats by one. Yeah. 2.1 is not bad. Almost 20% growth is not enough. Not enough. Let's take a look at this one. Look at that. Oh, we're even higher now. Our growth has been radical. It's always been above theirs, but like, it's radically. Debt cheapy ratio. Nice. So good, right? Yeah, 51. Good. Kwang Tung Army Kun Manchuria. Oh, it's expected to be really. Red Pulse from Sin King. Chief Executive Morita Kale stared out of the window of his private plane as he returned to Guangdong from his Sin King. He visited Manchukuo to attend the inauguration of President Zhu Jingtao. 
As was expected of him, um, as the leader of the prominent member of the spheres, so Morita and many others suspected that Yu Jingtao was not the real leader of Manchu Kuo. Uh, instead, it was the man behind the throne, General Katakura Tadashi. The leader of the Kwantung Army was now leader of Manchu Kuo as a whole all, in all but name. In some ways, this would be a stroke of luck for Guangdong, Morita thought. Kata Kuro was a man obsessed with military might. This single-minded focus on defense, combined with Machuko's already archaic approach to economics, meant that it was only a matter of time until Guangdong overtook the self-proclaimed spheres of brightest light, providing the supremacy of its model, which we already have. Although there's still domestic uh, <clears throat> threats, uh, and lingering in the shadows of Hong Kong and Macau, if they weren't dealt with, then the Guangdong could falter just like Machuko had. But always press your advantages. Give this one too. But at this point, I think we're pretty good. 70% is already pretty good, I'd say, so. The public health ordinance passes. As it should. The vote of the public health laws for Guangdong passed with limited difficulty. Sunni and Chung Kong delegates, backed by a sufficient group of Matsushita delegates permitted to do so by the leader, managed to win the vote over the objections of the Fujitsu and Hitachi delegations. That passed without difficulty. The real difficulty came afterwards, in the form of a fuming Ibuka, who used the opportunity given by the passage of the new law to go on, the, on a tirade against the state faction. Lee, Morita, you are a pair of bleeding hard, good for nothing dudes who are trying to force us to go along with your asinine reformist schemes and limit our businesses to suit your liberalizing whims. Don't you idiots realize that Guangdong exists to help people realize their innovative visions unencumbered by rules and regulation? If you dudes keep on going without somebody like me to challenge you, you'll make this place no different than Japan. You, Morita, are trying to drag us all down to your low, sentimental, pathetic, subhuman level. While Lee shook his head and laughed shortly, Morita looked amused, and Matsushita was visibly unimpressed. The rest of the delegates began to fight among themselves as Komai suddenly left, and Ibuka kept ranting like a petty imitation of the NSDAP NSDA speaker. For once, however, it was Sony and Chong Kong delegation shouting down the Fujitsu and Hitachi opposition, forcing them to form up into an advertised group for safety as the Matsushita men tried and only partially succeeded at separating the two sides. Yet yeah, another step forward. We get one more Sony seat, increases a lot of Zhu Jin and Chinese government support, and healthcare improves as well. Nice. 81%? 69%! Nice! And then Chinese support is 52%, so it's actually really good. Not bad. I'll spend this one. I don't want to spend a little bit of money for slightly more control here. Because that's the one we're going to be working on next, like I said. Uh, I still want to get rid of corruption. I know I'm sure some of you are already telling me like to do this again. We could, but still. Fine, dignity. And then... The question of work hours. So here now we're at 48 seats. We have, this used to be like 33, I think, if I remember. Adds ensure dignity amendment helps the bottom line of Guangdong economically increases Cheong Kong's initial support for the ordinance, which is already pretty high. Even though safety first seems like it's more. We could get this one passed even further. It's 53 seats. The question of work hours reduces a little bit of support, which means we will need to use corruption, maybe. Hmm. Probably do this one, disability insurance. <laughs> With the rate of workplace accidents in Guangdong, all it takes is one stroke of misfortune to wipe out one's things and condemn them to a life of poverty on the streets. The disabled eke out a truly wretched existence as beggars on the streets of the third, Three Pearls, their knees and foreheads bloody from scraping asphalt, growling for change from an increasingly desensitized populace. For a worker's sake, and as a business opportunity, we should encourage the sale of the disability insurance contracts in factories and workplaces across Guangdong. An accident need not spell the end of a person's life, for even while uh, even a maimed man may provide value, a dead man provides none. That's an insert of a pearly fish. The Pearl River was not actually as inviting as it once was, downstream from the electronics factories. It was a sore sight for old eyes. Garbage clumped together the bends of the river. The clarity once had most, was mostly gone, replaced by the dark bluish green tint. It looked nothing like the river on Lamb's childhood. But to be honest, it was uh, not hard to remember the river of Lamb's childhood, especially compared to the polluted Pearl River. Lamb could remember how crystal clear the water looked. How it reflected like jewels in the warmth of the midday sun. Lamb could remember the fish swimming through the clear waters. And he could remember setting up makeshift traps up and down the river, spending days with his friends building semicircles around from small pebbles and small stones to catch maritime life. And most of all, Lamb could remember those funny little green white creatures, their fat little chins and the panicked little croaking sounds they made when Lamb got a little too close to them. He put his eyes back to the electronics factories. He realized they had been shut. The sound, city sounded a little quieter, he realized, and the usual smoke sacks, tr truck combos, and garbage dumps were not present as they usually were. Lamb eyed up the river once again, it seemed a little cleaner, or was that just his eyes fooling him? Perhaps it would be fresh to fish him one day, like he would have seen those infantry photos when Koshi was still named Guangzhou. Lamb scoffed to himself, he wasn't a child, he must have had a fish trap in a decade by now, or have thrown out a fishing line for twice that long. Pushing himself back to his feet, Lamb slowly trotted down one of the many streets of Koshu, his mind whirling as he took a step after step. That was a nice thought, though. 
Nice. Actually, what's the support here? Uh, 1.25%. Yakuza is over 2%. That's a lot. Especially Macau. Wow. And then Triad Influence is 1.5. But uh, please, it's one, uh, that's not bad. 175 is pretty good. 1949, part 3. Morning air, atmosphere thick with lugubrious moans of businessmen whose enterprises were falling down to the chute in the garbage heap. Terminal velocity held with suspense. It was quite the long way down. Lamp found himself thinking of the fire at the end of the tunnel. How it burned and feasted on the crumbling foundations of the province. When someone was faint on the horizon, a pale light filtering its way through the clouds, tumbling, tumbling, lamb. He wiped the sweat out from his brow and proceeded to jog to his workplace. A rough down to workshop recess in Kowloon's deepest crannies. After his firm's failure, lamb sold everything. He owned and declared bankruptcy. His associates disappeared. For every day since the news broke, Lamp fastened a sweat bed on his forehead and proceeded to look for work in Port Shore again. <clears throat> Near the harbor, of course. Uh, uh, backbreaking work, even worse than his days as a porter. It kept him alive, however, paying for his humble breakfast of porridge and salted fish. Lamp spent his nights moonlighting those days, guarding the warehouses of the rich Japanese that had come to make a profit for themselves in the province. Dirty work, dirty, dirty work, but it paid. When the moon was full, he stared and wondered where the stars had hidden themselves within the folds of the universe. Back in his chest then, the night was full of wonders. One night he heard the creak of a hinge as it swung open to the back of the warehouse. He drew his gun and ran out of the corner to see half a dozen burglars trying to make away with tailoring equipment. The sight of those looms made Lamp see red for a moment. He raised his nambu on them. Back off, he shouted. Back off and I might just let you live. Their arms shot upwards, dropping their items where they lay. Yet, the look on those faces became seared forever in Lamb's memory. Disgust, hate, a myriad animosity for a man found working with a foreign invader. What are you waiting for? He shouted again. Go on, get out of here. He scurried away, scampering over the fence and through the underbrush. Lamp felt a weight settle on his chest. This had to end. There had to be some other way. Where had all the stars gone since, or hence, that men took the leave of their senses. Look at that, 22% real GDP growth, and almost no inflation. That's so nice. There we go. That'll definitely help us out. And get us below that level. This one's okay, it's not bad, but it's only one and a half. That's not enough, in my opinion. We have 79%, that's actually really good. 85%, everyone loves us. Oh, this is, oh the Boer Republic. Joins the pack. We'll see how long they last. This is going to take us some serious time to actually get up to where we need to be. So we're going to lose uh, Matsushita and Fujitsu seats if we do all those two. Matsu, Matsu, we have some seats. We were close. Eh. Slightly decreases workday, unlimited workday. Marit and friends come calling home. Wasn't uh, that good for nothing rice bucket of a man Okuma had said that there was a very important guest visiting the factory? Li Chan had disbelieved him, but jumping but still jumping at the opportunity to quit working early for once, even if it would be forced to give up more than his day later. On. Now the visitor, the chief executive, Morita Akeo himself, was looking around the factory. The factory most quick in span spick and span. The workers, even Chun himself, thought though he resented it, were on the best behavior. For Chun the this was made difficult by the rubbish at Okumo spewing. The manager waxed poetic about how well treated everyone was, how happy they were to work here because it meant that they could provide for themselves and the families. To Jun's surprise, Mirita was not taken in by Okumo's little pep top. Merely nodding shortly, he turned to the well dressed official next to him. Had Chun looked around yesterday, he would have found that this man was also the one standing around behind him. This man, Li Kishing, asked Okumo if everyone in the factory was well paid and allowed to, uh, uh, to leave on time. Okumo scoffed and said what Chun knew was a lot. Of course they are. Then Lee picked up a tape recorder and played back Okuma's words from yesterday, ordering the workers to make their up their early hours later on. Okuma turned pale as he played it back, then rallied, Chief Executive, you and this good for nothing have set me up to embarrass my company and the Empire of Japan. Lee merely pointed at Chun and spoke in Cantonese, you over there. Chun was surprised, yeah, what? Me, sir? Lee nodded, yes, you, you just heard the recording and it may be familiar to you. Please tell me who between me and Manager Okuma here is telling the truth between what happened yesterday. Chun smirked, once in a while justice could be found in this world. Well, Mr. Lee, you're telling the truth here. Actually, I probably should do this one first, because it'll give us more time to do these and get more votes back. The question of work hours. During no more times in Guangdong's factories, laborers work ten uh, shifts across two shifts, ten hour shifts across two shifts. In busy periods, people work eight hour shifts across three shifts without breaks. In our offices, workers are effectively on call at all hours, holding back from returning home for fear of earning the ire of their manager after a missed call. It's clear that this is exhausting, contributing both to workers' dissatisfaction and to greater workplace accident rates, neither which do anything for productivity. Well, I introduced the novel concept of taking breaks and limiting work hours to allow both machines and people to rest and recuperate. So we'll reduce Matsushita and Fujitsu seats. I still want to cut down on corruption. But we'll wait until the end so we can get this, uh, like another like Hitachi seat. You know what? Actually, we'll probably just grab this already. Let's go and grab that one. 
We're going to need it. We have 50 right now. We can just pass it. But we need at least one. It requires all three of these. So we're going to lose a few seats. But I want to really cut down on these two first. Actually, do we not have... What do we not have? We need more Sony seats. So we might as well just go and grab, grab our own. Yeah, go and grab, grab Sony's. That which followed. Though uh, Lee Chun had smirked as he watched Chief Executive Morita make a mockery of the good for nothing Okuma, he was still processing what just happened with some ten days ago or so from the man's visit. After the visit. Okuma and his boss Matsuda had been publicly ordered to do the right by the workers and obey the labor laws for once and were told that occupational health and safety audits would be scheduled for his workplace on a regular basis. When Hei and Y had heard that for once, somebody had been looking out for the average citizen, they had been overjoyed. At last, that joy turned into disappointment when Chun came home that evening, having been laid off, along with an entire shift of his employees earlier in the day. Chun, though sad, and was not particularly surprised. This was the way of a common person's life in Guangdong, after all, one step forward anywhere was two, two, 200 back. Chen was roused from his musings by a shout from the front door of his home, as he had mail, and it was important. It was a recruitment letter straight from the upper management at the Chunggong conglomerate, which Chun remembered was owned by Li Kaxing, a native Chinese that Chun had seen with Marita at the factory. It said that he could always use a pair of steady hands like his, and that they would give him good pay. But Li Chun found with some shock that for once he didn't really care about those things, quite the country, in fact. No, Chun's mind was filled with the thoughts of work at Chung Kong. I want to purge him too, but... Let's get through here first. Economic check soon. We need at least 35 billion. Well, I hope we passed it. Hey, we have sound. Hey, that's better. Sound fiscal health now. Better inflation rate and more political power. No wonder it was, it was looking better earlier. 20% not bad. So 51 drops down to what? 48. That's not good. Um, the work hour must matter. Oh, Wong Ho Fai, no, oh, no, to his Japanese co workers, appears Ishida Shintaro, groaned in displeasure as another nuisance of application form appeared at the top of the room of papers that sat on his desk at the Hong Kong Labor Bureau all day, every day of the darn week. This town was yet another one of those applications from a company seeking permission to extend its working hours, citing purpose, purposes essential to the continued functioning of our business, as most of them tended to do. Due to these kinds of forms have been, become part of Ho Fai's new reality. After the decree from the Legislative Council that the labor rules preventing daily work shifts longer than eight hours would be strictly enforced, Countless firms, mostly Japanese, but a few Zushin firms too here and there had sent in forms to the Labor Bureau requesting permission to grandfather their work hours and timing in. Of course, this latest form, just like virtually all others before him, it was over utter rubbish and he rejected it, it as such. As So Fai sent the stamp marked Kayaka, rejected on the form, he noted with dry humor that his orders stood very little chance of being followed. All the stamp that would do, Ho Fai knew, would put the offender on notice that they were acting in contravention of the law. Not like that would make much difference, getting that to happen would require the let go to get up and actually pass an actual law. Wong Ho Fai had been in Guangdong for more than enough time to know that there was no hope for something like that ever happening. Such good things happen anywhere but here, he thought. While Suzuki's attempts to improve working conditions via the revised labor standards ordinance was commendable, extreme poverty remains a fact of life for countless thousands across Guangdong despite the laborers' toil. The simple fact of life is that the wages are far beneath the rising cost of living and basic necessities in Guangdong's expanding cities, while dwindling opportunities in the rural areas that aren't linked to the close economies of corporate towns or mining settlements consign thousands of mere subsistence. But for the people's sake, and for the leveling of the playing field among the corporations in terms of cost, we'll formally propose an institute of minimum wage in Guangdong, and that's so that the survival of the masses is no longer in doubt, if not a good life. It's something we definitely, definitely, definitely want. But we're going to do this one first, since we might as well. Since we got to get them all done anyways, right? And instead of Fujita Matsushita seats, Hitachi's probably where we're going to hit. I don't give that. I like to do that one too, but whatever. Um... Yeah, you know what's good. What we want to do this one. Prologue. Yasukawa Yoshiko, accompanied by our government minder, Hayashi Kosen, was on the hunt in Koshu, seeking a good story, of course. She was unfortunately hobbled in this pursuit by the fact that she could speak barely you no know, essentially no Cantonese except hello, how are you, goodbye, and drop dead. Eventually she had to settle for talking to a Japanese factory owner who Brian when he saw her, he had been looking for a journalist to vent to. The man, Masuda Fujito by name, had a lot of end about. Those good for nothing bureaucrats are strangling, strangling the industry in the city. With all the thrice darned government health regulations, it's taken away my profits and making conditions worse to the factory. The interview continued on within this vein for good over 30 minutes. Yoshiko thought it would be credible and accepted it at face value until he saw that Officer Hayashi, a minder, clearly uncomfortable, was rolling in his eyes at what Matsuda was saying every now and then. After the interview ended, 
ended. Yoshiko asked the officer why he was so uncomfortable. Hayashi was blunt. I'll love you, Miss Yasukawa. The man is 100% not telling you the full story. I have it on very good authority that the factory was in a, fact in a tourist sweatshop. If you talk to any of the Cantonese speakers in the area, you'd find out that sooner rather than later. Oh, but that's to be expected, given how you only know how, I say, how to say, I hope your family gets run over in Cantonese. Yoshiko, a bit hurt by Hayashi's bluntness, fired back. Then, that, then what's the real story, Mr. Hayashi? Hayashi Kosen, Lam Haosyun, that is, was surprised by this development, and he mulled his next course of action. Perhaps it might do her some good to jump down this rabbit hole. Yeah, that's not bad, 20%. Not bad. Happy 1968, basically, everybody. Happy New Year. We're spending a little bit more on the military. Oh, we're still in this area here, too. My god. Did we lose yet? Here? Come on, Japan. Come on, Indonesia. They're attacking him. Fear of living in LA. We wonder about that. Please go right ahead. Ooh. Ooh. 0.56. Don't worry, be happy. When a Chen man Hin arrived with assembly in Juka, uh, the crowds were enormous. Now he transformed into an enormous hot spring resort. Uh, the little huts on lean toes of the old village have been replaced with towering new hotel complexes. The air was thick with steam and so warm that Ch Chan could feel his pores popping. Everyone liked Ling Tan, so as to not get lost, and Chan led his family to their hotel, opened only for a few months ago by Sony. It only had booked one room for the four of them, his teenage brother and his parents, but he didn't anticipate space being an issue. They were spending most of the days lounging in the springs anyway. He left his family with the luggage in the lobby and went to find the reception instead. He came across an awkward scene. A cleaner actually knocked a guest a coffee cup off of the tables in the lobby and was apologizing profusely as the hotel manager screamed at her. One of the Juka natives, Chan recalled, the poor woman looked like she was about to crumple under the onslaught. They'd all lost their homes to the developers once the first tourists had started coming here. It couldn't have been easy to see their entire lives turn into servants for bathers. The poor could go down too far to that line of thought. Chan shut it off. It's their holiday. He was going to use the opportunity to relax. Besides, it wasn't like he could do anything for them anyway. The room had not a speck of dust on it. Nice. Uh, you know what? Go ahead and start doing that too. We'll get 1.83, which is very nice. Uh, no inflation. That's right. That's the type of Guangdong I like. Absolutely no inflation. So we'll do that one, and we'll do the meeting of Fujitsu. Then we'll actually see what how much support we actually do need, because we need we will need a little bit more. I don't want to water down any more if possible. So then we get Hitachi. Yeah, we're just gonna grab Hitachi. Because that makes it 49, but then we're going to reduce it a little bit more. There shouldn't be too many more seats lost, in all honesty. It was a relatively pleasant day outside Fujitsu's Koshu offices. The sky was blue and comparatively free of smog for once. All the more unfortunate than that Ibuka and his guest, Koma Kenichiro, far from enjoying the weather, were instead consumed with the quiet rage of the antics of Morita Akeo and Li Kaxing. Ibuka scoffed in displeasure after hearing Komai's recounting of Morita's and Li's plans and went off on a tirade. Those accursed bleeding hearts are trying to drag the rest of Guangdong down. To the level. If they can't compete a mayor, the way only anyone in their right mind would do it, they'll just force all to pay for their mistakes. And the worst of it all is that a cursed Matsushita, acting like a human weather vane and looking out for himself as always, will go along with their nonsense. A smile and leave Komai's face. Why don't you just ignore the law if it's such nonsense? Ibuka huffed in anger. Don't you remember that our companies are still subjected to the lead co? This ain't Manchukuo. We're the state would back you up the whole way. Now the smile left Kumai's face and began to bristle. His response to the sound was more testy. I advise you to take the note that this initiative of theirs hasn't been passed through con the council yet. So it's perfectly <clears throat> valid to ignore it for the foreseeable future. Ibuka hadn't thought of that. It was a pretty good point, all things considered. I've taken a brief moment to consider the implications to reach a conclusion. Alright, that works. Let's do it. So we need four more. Oh my god, four more votes. So if we can actually pass this. This would be huge. So, we could get no subsidies and replace it with trinket subsidies to ensure dignity. Um, it helps poverty, which we need. H highly increases unemployment. Increases Chinese government support. Increases China's opinion of us. Oh. Increases Hong Kong's sleep ice 1. We replace unlimited workday with a 14 hour workday, which actually helps out with uh, research speed, stability, growth, which we want, want more stability. Hurts output, though, which is fine. But again, better is poverty. Um, with no, it replaces no minimum wage with trinket minimum wage, which hurts needy consumers' goods and productivity cap, but gives us more stability as well and better poverty. So, this is actually really important to pass. 46. That's a little insane, not gonna lie. Bribe our own Leco seat. So, what are we looking? We have, oh, we have quite a few seats we can get from Sony still. Ooh, I don't want any more corruption though. That's a little high. Can we get four seats? Can we really get three seats? So right now we're at 85%. A cap to 85. We're almost at the cap. Honestly, we could get more political power from here. It's 90%, which is not great. 
I don't mind reducing Chinese support, maybe. For 25 more political power. This would be good to do as well. You know what? It's only 2.5%. We're going to do it. 2.5%. Oh, I don't want to do it, but we need more political power, too. 1949, Part 4. Remember to start, I had lived up river, in a small village just outside of the Shinzan a few years ago. The son of a farmer, I made my living hauling fish from the sea while the family clung to the memories of old mulberry orchards for which the empires found Belad. In the meantime, father sailed away to America, of course. Seeking hope and maybe also a little glory, the uncertainty of the Trans-Pacific relations meant that correspondence was never stable. Some days I would come home, a box of envelopes tucked under my elbow. Some other days, nothing. Mother's always anxious for him. I wonder, how does she keep up with all this? Up river where no roads reached, so close to the rushing vein of the world yet so far. Outside Japanese vans, broadcast in Cantonese and Japanese, the propaganda of the new state. Guangdong for the new Pan-Asian dream, stronger together. China must do its part for the co-prosperity sphere. Hacking need platitudes st staunching the onrush. I remember those men in khaki uniforms, rifles and sabers, shot and stabbed so these people can pair the dream of dead visionaries from the safety of their vehicles. I scoffed and walked on. I was no better than they were, dressed in my tattered suit, holding the empty briefcase, a grim destination to my mind. There's gotta be another way, I thought, I thought last night. I futilely checked the mail for news from father. Nothing. No briefcases full of money sent from overseas can cure this pain or restlessness that I feel. I chose this way. The winds of change had shaken me off those mulberry trees where the dreams of silk once hung. In times like these, charity did nothing for a man. I had to live. I must keep on choosing. Outside the bus terminal buildings, uh, the shape and color of faded cinder blocks arranged themselves into one enclosure. A guard checkpoint about the entry and exit points. Police assigned proclaimed I must choose. One foot before the other, I stepped into the limbo of existence. So now with this one, we can actually do all these other ones and get way more uh, seats. Probably our own Letco seats. Yeah, that's the one we gotta do. 68%, my god. Seventy-four percent. Now we're back down to sixty-two. And I know we'll be working on that more, but now where are we at? We need one more vote. No economic review. Get back to work. Okay, so we didn't have to do that last one. We could have just waited to do that one. We need forty-one billion. That's going to be pretty tough to get. Um. Yeah, at this point, uh, actually, I should not have done that one. No, actually, no, we got three more seats. But the current votes, we still need one more. So we just took them all from someone else. So we get one more seat, we'll be fine, right? Right. 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 Kind of sucks, but whatever. A grand opening. Li Kaxing was opening a new part of an increasingly large Chung Kong conglomerate and an insurance firm. And the crowd of employees gathered to listen to their bosses of bosses talk. Two employees, one Chinese, a woman named Quan Hiu Lam, and the other Zhujin man came called Chan Han He, uh, were listening. Man Hai, or He, was running a live translation for Hiu Lam, who was unfortunately couldn't understand much more than hello, goodbye, and darn it in Japanese. That was a fairly standard corporate pep talk at the beginning. Do your job. It's an exciting new frontier in the financial world. Great opportunity for everyone to grow, mature, and gain experience. Really proud of everyone's achievements thus far. But near the end, to Hugh Lam, Man Hei, and everyone else was surprised, Mr. Lee took off his glasses and told the simple crowd something much less conventional. Before I end off, please allow me to offer one big piece of advice. Don't just think this is as a product, but as a chance to say to our clients that if an accident happens, Chung Kong is there to take care of you. Later on, over a pleasant lunch, Liu Ham and Man Hei had had a chat. Thanks for translating. <clears throat> Mr. Lee's speech for me, Man Hey. My Japanese isn't really all that great, even though I was once one of the few kids in my neighborhood that made it at high school. Man Hey he simply nodded and said it was no problem at all. Hugh Alam smiled. You don't know how happy that makes me. You know, coming here, I expected that, seeing as how I'm a second class Chinese student, only useful for talking to clients. I'll be a lot more alone. I only wanted to send money to my parents. The only big dream I've had, I've got, is to help them against the off chance something like that goes horribly wrong in one of those factory heck holes, like I did for so many people for my friends' parents, like it did for them. Man, hey, not an acknowledgement. Well, maybe things will make change now, or will change now. Even if they don't, Hugh Lam, I've got your back. Hugh Lam smiled in thanks and the amended Labor Standards Ordinance. They declare a commitment to improving workers' rights is one thing, but a follow through to complexion is quite another. We can only take ad hoc executive action via the understaffed and overworked Labor Bureau for so long. For our firms have any chance of being carried out in a comprehensive manner, we must win the approval of the Legislative Council. The proposed measures are nowhere near enough to be ideal for workers, but it's a good first step. Such is the reality of politics in Guangdong, where we cannot simply let the perp become the enemy of the good. And the quagmire tomorrow. 
It's not enough to address the crises of today. For Seo and Chung Kong's leadership be fully accepted, we must be one step ahead of the social issues of tomorrow. What good is a man who believes that it's true only that which his eyes can see? Task him with a compromised apartment. Sure, he'll doubtless the broken the stairways, the faulty fire alarms, the crumpled wallpaper. I'll ask him why simple-minded clerks' numbers don't add up, and they'll be quick to point out their mistaken sums. They're sloppy assumptions. But what are the marshy ground holding it off? Ten stories of rusted rebar and crack lidded concrete. What are the clerks who are no clerk, but a child who never learned to sum? Students who never learned accounting because of the schools never bothered. Are the complex collapses like pancakes, the universities report their own dismal numbers. When the inquiries are shouted and fingers pointed, who else is to blame but the man with the more sight than foresight? Companies are no less immune for to his failing, such a failing than men. Men expected to give it from them even. That may apply to repairs, but not to Sony, nor to Jiang Kong. We've come too far to repeat their mistakes. If Guangdong expects foresight from the government, then foresight we, we good businessmen shall provide at generous rates. Monster Shida's demand. Stanley Hill watched a procession of suited men exit Chief Executive Maria's office. Nor in the corporate lapel pens fix their otherwise rabble and powder pack jackets. What did the Matsushita people want? Stanley consciously pulled his shirt cuffs as he took a seat opposite Marito, letting his cufflinks appear out from underneath the sleeves of his tailored uh, navy blue checkered suit. Not like the external, external secretary who sent his men to do his own job, men usually first in line to take credit for everything. <coughs> it wasn't at Matsushita's direction, Marito said, his arms folded in frustration. They wanted to support the labor ordinance. Oh boy. But well, there's a catch. Stanley finished Marita's slot instinctively, earning a nod from Marita. Weaken the labor protections, lower the wage stipulations, create exemptions. Uh, things like that, Marita leaned for, offering a lot of Stanley. And they said that if they, I, was, I wasn't willing to go along with them, that I could uh, say goodbye to the getting any more sport. Stanley lit a cigarette without a word, working the angles as he took a lazy drag. He could Im imagine the yapping of a Matsushita dog on the legislative council floor already. All bark, no bite, they could be safely ignored. Uh, weaken security protections. I hope we get at least another vote here. We should. Success of the amendment as well as the challengers. So this one's I've read before, but this one's going to remove uh, four seats from us, um, basically, which is really bad because we have 48 seats between Sony and Chong Kong, but we're not going to touch that until we read about the success of the amendment. Today, the four controlling powers of the Legislative Council, Ibuka, Matsushita, Morita, Komai, joined as they often were by Lee Kashin of Chong Kong, debated the proposal of amending the Labor Standards Ordinance to include more stringent protections for workers. <coughs> the de debate began. Hard and fast with Lee defending the proposal and its merits. Protecting worker welfare would, after all, ensure less worker mortality and injuries, thereby increasing profits. It was countered by disdainful Ibuka, who argued that there was absolutely no need to worry about the worker welfare as a means to uh, increase profits to another, more efficient methods could be pursued. Matsushita, on the other hand, simply argued that all of them were only in this to make a profit as a businessman, and any method outright or ought to be afforded fair consideration. <clears throat> Marita argued that Suzuki Taichi had it completely right when he argued that the long-term interests of Guangdong demanded some kind of protections and were guarantees for workers. Thus, Guangdong ran out of workers before it ran out of money. At that point, Komai utterly lost the debate for his no side by scoffing and saying that people could be imported just like anything else. While the other four speakers had gotten some kind of applause for their arguments, Komai only got a zen-like silence, having put his foot into his mouth and tried to eat it. As a result, the vote swung in Marita's favor. <coughs> now, uh, we'll get one more seat here. And doing all this will be very good. And then we'll do this one, even though we get more corruption, which really sucks. And uh, we really can't afford any more corruption with 69%, Jesus Christ. Um, I guess we start doing this one to mitigate just a little bit, but we have to get ready for the product launch as well. Um, but we're ready this one earlier. The Quagmire of tomorrow is too, so. Yeah, did we get it in too? Very nice. Um, very high approval 87, 84%, 92%. Just very good. We're about to get better data storage processes. And, uh, yeah, over on that bed. Less than two months now. You know, I do want to do... I want to do this one as well. But corruption. We're getting closer, though, though with this one, though. Because right now, where, where, where are we at? We're at 82%. We're at 71%. That's very good. More growth, less corruption every month. And this one gives more G real GDP growth. And 2% more opinion cap. <coughs> so next, investing, investing in human capital. People, not machines, or mineral deposits are Guangdong's greatest resource. Reform the civil service. Uh, we don't have enough for this one. Mm -hmm. The housing crisis. Oh boy. 47. Public housing focus. Well, let's read this first. Husbands and wives spend 20 or more years of wealth and time with their children for a good reason. For all that, a machine can lift heavier weights and faster crunch numbers. It's ultimately men who design machines and gather them towards their purpose. Properly fed, properly raised, and properly taught, man give, given machine will solve the world's ails and be, get better the family's lot through ingenuity and drive. Even if dictators acknowledge that man is the most precious capital, what should preclude a capitalist from doing likewise? Quarterly profit margins? 
hidebound foolery. For Morita and Lee, Guangdong's future rests not in cheap metal knickknacks made by unthinking slaves, but <clears throat> in silicon wares crafted by artisans who dream. Sudi and Chungkang will make it so. <coughs> hey, more political power, nice. Something that we love. Scenes from the end wrote one. And Ko Shu, two fledgling. Uh, oh, I've heard this one before. God dang it. Uh, man. Did I read this one before? Yeah. God dang it. We have so much corruption, it's not funny. Honestly, I might just do one of these in instead. Adjust incentives. Um, increase admin cost by 0.1 billion. I might just do it, adjust the sentence. Yeah. There's another comment from one of the previous videos said, uh, the more you go down here, the, eventually you can't bribe other people to do your, uh, pass your legislation, so. 2.5%. 1.75. Into the ranks. Or to adjust the sentence. Punishing corp the corrupt has ever been popular among the people, as Marita would have campaigned so hard for it. More than providing, proving that justice is still alive in Guangdong, public space contrition for a man of ill-gotten wealth safe, satisfies to expose the lesser's uninvestor level. Retribution only deters man from error, however. The desires which lead them to it will still remain. For their part, our public servants desire financial security in the city with more expenses than anywhere else. As such, the chief executive believes the review of the civil authorities pay scales is long overdue. For the stated wall is less inclined to seek dirty money, and a lot of walls will leave Guang of the government house, stated once the review concludes. <coughs> the word spreads. Dinner for the Lee family didn't change much that evening. Boiled bok choy, steamed rice, preserved fish. There wasn't much seasoning, salt, a dash of white pepper for a bite. But even the simplest meal tasted fresher than the news that the chief executive had. Against the odds, guaranteed new labor protections as well. Oh, look at this. Minus point two. Nice. Chun idly wondered if they could ever save enough for an extra bottle of oyster sauce. Enough to use for, uh, for outside the festive days. He felt wise elbows prodding him. Who were Morita and Lee? Were they good men? They didn't say offhand yes, but he didn't say no either. Lamb lazily sipped his soy milk, watching the growing mob at the intersection. A newspaper vendor scrambled onto a box a minutes later, holding a second newspaper announcing the passage of the chief executive's Amrita's amended labor ordinance. A few passerbys had turned into a crowd, and a throng, and finally a mob, all wondering if this was the start of something new, something better. Lamb left a bill on the counter, checking only to make sure it was enough. He didn't ask for the change. You should go sip your tea as you listen to a radio at her desk, above the complaints of a Japanese manager lamenting the new labor laws. Through the granny broadcast, you could hear Morita's formal remarks ending, only for an unfamiliar voice to speak an accented but confident Japanese. Chung Kong was built by many individuals, but not, but not just one person. Our work is important, but if we all want to be successful, our workers must feel like they belong here. The times demand change. 45 days. Yeah, whatever we do, we're going to lower corruption. Yeah, 70% is very good. Less than 10% growth. Uh, doesn't make me happy. And corruption, uh, not corruption, but inflation is back up to that, that high now, huh? You know what, screw it, we're going to do this one too. This is not close, not close. Uh, this one's not close at all, so this one's close ish. And we'll do the one that just costs a little bit of money, because that's easier to manage. I'll just. 1.83? Oh, the Yakuza have quite a bit of influence too. Interesting. Nice. Uh, I like doing this one as well, just the monthly research speed. Okay, we'll do that one too. So Connor resigns. Oh, here we go. 70% is pretty high. Quagmire's and Marl, just incentives. Advancements in automobile technology? Yes, please. Ah, oh, we do have a cup of coffee to keep some nice and warm too. The performance civil service might not be bad. Nice. So reform the civil service. 42 now. Um, the Cantonese question. Choice for a language government will be heavily scrutinized from within without. Choose carefully. Full localization. Make, make Cantonese official working language of Guangdong. Fully localize the civil service so that the Zhujin can be in all ranks and positions. So if you do this, you lose <coughs> Matsushita seats and one seat from Fujitsu. So that's uh, about three seats. But you max, you get 10% more owning Chung Kong seats. Admin efficiency begins to improve. More Zhujin Chinese support. It's not bad. Localized civil service will be added to assorted laws or a trusted core. To maintain the quality of public service, we must maintain a trust score of Japanese trained civil servants. That's what we'll say publicly, anyways. Zhujin opportunities will be expanding, but keeping a trust score of Japanese expatriates for higher administrative positions. Reform the civil service. 
<coughs> Guangdong's government has often been accused of being a colonial administration all but name. Dominated at the top and the middle levels by Japanese and Japanese trained bureaucrats who answered to the boredoms of Tokyo and Koshu. No matter how many Zhujin or the rare educated Chinese patrol the streets and file papers, low, uh, lowly patrolmen and clerics will never earn the trust of the population as long as they see the Japanese as masters of Guangdong. But to assure backers in the Zhujin and Chinese communities that their problems will be kept to and ensure that our new policies are directed as effectively as possible, but certain eye to addressing the composition of Guangdong civil service, our public face of the world, and a prominent means of social advancement for those Zhujin and Chinese with, it, with means. Yeah, that'd be good to do. Um, where are we at for this one? 15 days left, wow. 71% is very corrupt. Now we're down at 16, huh? That sucks. 7 days left. We're close to getting overtaking them here, actually, with the police. That's good. How much do we get up every month? Half, almost half a percentage. And the beginning of the 1968 product cycle. Nice. 15% and 4 product quality. And then 0 to 50. 50%. Wow. Okay, so where do we start? We started with 50. 0 to 50? We got 50? Holy crap. That's very nice. Uh, the Triniton television, huh? So we really need product quality. We sold it to them before. Chinese government support goes down. More profitability. We sold it to the Turks before. The Mexicans? I want to go and do the Brazilians, but Iberia? Let's do Iberia. Alright, so that's 12 and a half. It's very good to do. 12 and a half is very good to do. 10% is not bad. I keep spending more here, but we can wait a little bit too. Get more, even more profitability. Oh, big announcement. <clears throat> Hold on, let's give it a second here. Oh, it's auto saving. Recall 1955 February. Gone boy! Stanley Ho, Morito Kao, and Li Kishin clink their cups together. The noise blending seamlessly in the cacophony of the crowded eatery in the Wang Chai. Even as the Lunar New Year shut down Hong Kong, there were still a few establishments open. Those catering to the Japanese who didn't celebrate, and those catering to everyone else, of course. <coughs> This latter suited the three of them just fine, not least because they did not want it for nourishment. An endless stream of well-wishers and passerbys would come and congratulate Lee, clapping him on the shoulder while holding newspapers that showed Lee's beaming face. And TR-56 transistor radio in Outstretch Chan, the first transistor radio in Guangdong. Even if the one-year-old Sonus Lee Electronics Company had been the first to release of transistor radio in the sphere, that was Fujitsu, followed by Matsushita. They even had a rush to design Guangdong shelves, with Lee's factory working at a full tilt to supply Stanley Ho's network of runners. And with promised quality and affordable price, even the poorer Chinese and Zhujin were quick to embrace the future. As the festivities hit a lull, Lee fell Marita's cup while bowing his head. I should apologize. Without your ideas, I couldn't have come this far. Compared to what I owe you, it's nothing, Marita shook his head modestly, even as his Cantonese grew more confident. Not that many would take a chance on a Japanese man dying in the street. When Kishin told me this could be good money, why wouldn't I take the risk? Stanley chortled, puffing a cigarette with a cocky grin, but business is in her blood. Now you understand that. Now you're one of us, drink up, and a big announcement. The Guangdong police bulletin went out that one fine day in Koshu, seeming not kissed until one of the last few lines and realized how important it was. It's their intention to increase the budget for personnel and review pay standards and bonuses in light of the prevailing economic conditions and the living needs of the Guangdong police. The last clause confused everybody in the police force so far. As Am Hyun Soon knew, it was the first time that the clause about economic conditions and living needs had been used to refer to a prospective pay increase. He had no idea what it meant, nor did any of his colleagues or his superiors knew. Even the people he disliked the most were united with him in confusion. In a fit of desperation, he took the bullet into Yasukawa Yoshiko and asked her, What on earth could this mean, Mr. Yasukawa? Everyone I know is stumped. Yoshiko hit her glee as being the one uh, informing Mr. Hayashi about something rather than the other way around and told her, told him about her hypothesis. Well, it's not just a reward, I think, but a uh, care, too. The thinking I've been he heard is that the corruption begins because the rank and file aren't paid enough to turn and turn to crime to make up the difference. <coughs> and that was so confused. But in heaven's name, are they going to find the money for all that? Do they know how many of us there are? Yoshiko demurred. I don't know either, Mr. Hayashi. Uh, but then again, if the government is looking to fire corrupt officers, maybe they could reject some of that in your wallet. Lam nodded and thought he was still confused. Probably was. I kind of want to wait and see if we can get those things back. 951 Part 1. Uh, two years in the forest, snap patrols through neon lights, lit as a city breathed in smokestacks, jutting up in the factories beyond the city's lights, or the city limits. Lamb disdained his uniform, the badge and insignia marked him as a stranger in his own homeland. Still, it was better than begging for food in the slums of Kowloon. When he was patrolling the night's out, uh, night market alleys, a sack of boxes burst outwards to reveal the profile of a man with a knapsack full of goods on his back. Shouts rang forth from beyond the man. Stop, and the boy said, heaving with exhaustion, he's got my things. 
Then I'm spraying into action, of course. Uh, the security jobs he worked in two years prior were beginning to pay off. If I was legs forward, his bald, he bought forwards, and his instinctive cry rose to his throat. Stop right there, he said, stop in the name of the law. The man saw him turn to run into the wall the city's maze of apartments, living spaces, stores, and open air stalls. Then gave the chase, hurtling through counters laden with street food, elbowing past the crowds, and shimming through the edges formed when groups intermingled and separated. <coughs> the thief was quick, but Lamb was steadier, better built. The man looked back to see Lamb getting on him in between gasps of ex uh, uh, ex ex exhaustion. Exhalation, before returning his gaze just in time to slam against the porter carrying boxes of heavy merchandise. He collapsed in the meantime. Lamb pulled the handcuffs on his belt and locked the man's wrist in them. You're under arrest, he said. You have the right to remain silent. He chanted the thief's rights in both Cantonese and Japanese. <coughs> Lamb brought the man and knapped sat back to the alleyway. The owner gave him uh, unctuous thanks, all in fluent Japanese. He says, I don't know Lamb's name. Patrolman Hayashi, he said, reluctantly giving his way his Japanese name. You're welcome. Now I have to get back to the precinct. Gotta get this guy, bring this guy in for questioning. Waving the owner off, he hauled the criminal back to the station, and Gus comp complaints at all. He was thankful this was easier than some other nights. Hmm. Point one three, not bad. Cantonese question. Simple fact of the matter is that while Japanese is a lingua franca, the corporate sphere is fear in the language of business. The vast majority of the people of Guangdong speak Cantonese. The government of Guangdong has until now remained firmly on the side of the Japanese on all official transactions, as expected of the governing authorities in the sphere, but has done little to bring the government closer and make it more relatable to the people. It's also created opportunities for communities and criminals to slip through cracks of parts of our administration, with a particularly unscrupulous among them using their language expertise to manipulate and extort the people ostensibly under their care. To officially recognize Cantonese as the language of the state would not only allow us to bring these groups under the eye of a government and serve as a powerful symbol of the commitment to a more local government, but also serve as a powerful distinction with the neighboring Republic of China. That is, if the Japanese don't throw a fit first. We'll disapprove, but whatever. I'm look for more here, too. Oh, another production unit? Oh, yes, please. Good luck on that. Cabildo? Huh. So 15 political power just for 5%, or 10 political power for this one. Oh, we're gonna spend 10 for 5, but why not? Chokoi? Which one's Chokoi again? Nah, we're pretty good with Chokoi. <coughs> Excuse me. 43 votes. The radical proposal. Merchantly expected their next proposal to meet resistance, opening up the higher ranks of the civil service and, and other police locals to those vetted carefully for both competency and reliability, presented a sea of change. A sea change that dented to the Japanese prerogative to the senior positions of the government, but they hadn't expected much resistance, how much there would be, and the meeting dissolved it acrimony near instantaneously. Matsushita had hard and on and on, playing, playing for time. The obvious argument against this proposal, and I'm not saying I'm opposed, is that even if you open up these positions, how many locals are both qualified and ready to fill them? Shouldn't we start from there? You seem there's going to be anyone qualified to fill them at all, Ibuka said, had scoffed at that. I'm not ruling it out, but from what I've seen, I have my doubts. <coughs> you can rule it out, Ibuka, come I, uh, commented acidly. A smile twisting as he shot Leah poison square. There are no good Chinese professionals, either here or in Harbin, I can assure you. Lee resisted the exception to throw his glass of water in Kamai's face, as well as the urge to shoot a worried glass of Marita. To do either would betray uncertainty, a weakness they could not afford. It might be a novel concept to some of you, but I think as an employee has as much stake in a company as their employer. Marita pointing his finger at the assembled tycoons to make his final point. If we don't give the people a stake in their own lives, then they'll demand one by force sooner or later. One more under the breach. So two days left for 5% more, which is not great, but whatever. <coughs> Excuse me for my coughing. Oh my goodness. My body's so waking up, isn't it? Politicalization. Li Kaxing argues that if we were to fully unlock the potential Guangdong's people and win their trust and loyalty, let's give them some sense to say how their affairs are governed. It will not be instant, nor will it be grand in scope, but I will commit to opening the most senior positions in our social service to all backgrounds, including native Chinese and Zhujim, and build our own institutional expertise without relying on Tokyo. The Japanese expatriates and senior mandarins would attest this for us, no doubt, but the journey to a better future begins with a single step, uh, and we must be the ones to take it. Pretty much. There's this one now. Commenter, no? <clears throat> All the Russian government of the Far East. Uh, WRF is over there, too. Oh, boy. 
<coughs> there we go. That upset's pretty nice. And then disparate measures. Um, let's see where we're at, because we can always do more uh, <coughs> anti-corruption things, of course, as well. Oh, that's really bad for corruption, my god. Sixty-five, sixty-four percent. At least not seventy yet. Uh, where are we at? Thirty-nine days left. Seventy and eighty. That's not bad. We did get some engineers from Japan, though. We're at ninety-two percent. <coughs> hmm. Fifty percent is not bad. I'll do it, why not? We're talking about money. 3%, we get 5% at the end, maybe. <clears throat> I'm at 4%, that's still very good. Getting this question. <coughs> and of course, we're going to do the one on the left here, full localization. And then, the civil service ordinance. Life of Guangdong is not easy, despite our best efforts. In an atmosphere where profits prioritize above all else, there's only so much we can ask from the collective effort at the highest levels where competition is a way of life. <coughs> We have taken the first step to show that the, to the people that the government can and will provide an opportunity for a better life. As we show solidarity to the people of this Eshelong nation, we now call upon the people to persevere, to direct their energies from simple survival to prosperity. To take ownership, however, part of your home is it to commit yourself to survival, we must ask the same as Zhujin and the Chinese, taking charge. Lam Hao Sun had never paid the job openings much to mind, posted on the corkboard hanging next to the stairwell in his precinct. But at a certain point, you know, everyone knew you weren't going to get anywhere if you weren't Japanese or had connections with the Leko, no matter how well any Zhujin spoke or wrote the language. That was useless to try, so why worry? But everything that had happened, since Morita Akeo had become chief executive, hadn't escaped Lan's notice either. From workers' pay to health and safety, the chief executive and his lieutenants were pushing for change, of the kind that Lam hesitantly approved of. Even though he thought they were courting disaster, the bullpen had been buzzed with rumors that the next round of personnel changes and promotions would see qualified Zhujin employees and officers allowed to vets in the middle management and beyond have merited. They have been examined, interviews, and in Cantonese, whether one was excited or irritated, varied, but it was all anyone could talk about. It was all Lam could think of over about lunch, mulling over the promotion to a sergeant as he absent mindedly swirled Kong Yi in his bowl. If he could use a, use a pay, he could use a pay, and if it came with more responsibility, well, then that just means he could do things his way, giving orders rather than just taking them. It was worth a shot. Lingua Franca. Well, the government's decision extends so official status of the Cantonese language, which now rises of exactly what the status should be. We could classify it as a working language. This would allow for its use to reduce instruction in schools, the creation of Cantonese versions of various official documents that the average citizen may need to fill out, and the hiring of Cantonese-speaking bureaucrats in public-facing positions. However, all officials within government documentation will still be Japanese, which will remain in the primary official language of Guangdong. These changes will make for navigating a government instituting Institutions significantly easier for Cantonese speaking citizens while sparing us the burdensome of task of adopting Cantonese as a true official language. However, in continuing to privilege Japanese over the local language, even though they internally could all send the wrong message, and keeping official records only in Japanese will make them inaccessible to large swaths of the population, hurting our push for greater transparency. The way around these problems would be adopting Cantonese as a true a second official language of equal status of Japanese. Let's require us to create official Cantonese copies of all government records and paperwork, an expensive and time consuming task, but one that may pay off making your government closer to people. A working language. Official language. Yeah, I'll probably do that one. Here we got one more vote out of that. That's not bad. Five more seats. Two more seats. If we get this max of these two out, then we would, we would have more than enough. Of course, we reduce seats here too. But then again, if we lose uh, Fujitsu seats, we already lost them. So, 1951 part two. <coughs> Coffee and cigarettes. The break room of the Kowloon police station housed a coffee machine that spewed significant, slightly rancid brown liquid. Coming off from the shift, Lamb hung his coat and took a plastic cup, draining some of that coffee into it. He sat down at a table and drew a cigarette from his breast pocket, slightly draining shift. His eyes felt slightly red. After this, Lamb would go home and watch the TV for some new morning news before collapsing just as the sun rose. He saw his workmates as amble about the concrete floor, talking in groups of two about their work, personal lives, and family. What little politics they discussed related to the formation of the new legislative council in Guangzhou. A sense of canine loyalty stuck about his feelings uh, as he eavesdropped on the interiors of others' routines. Well, we were a different breed, he thought. 
Dog, serving a master, faithful to the pack. One of the sergeants strode into the room and told him to gather for a meeting in the briefing room. They all drained their cups and dragged their cigarettes following in the wake of the officer. From this day on, the Japanese inspector said, continuing from his usual bromides of service and loyalty, he would be transferred to the Koshu. The strange name was a Japanese on Yomi, reading of Guangzhou. The purpose of your transfer is to be an integration preparation and performance examination of the upcoming formation of a unified independent Guangdong police force. Am I understood? A way of a positive answer to affirmative statements. Lam raised his hand. He'd been on the streets long enough to know that, that the Kampak Tao was involved. The armed banded military police wing of the Japanese army, always ready to seize profits where they could. Kowloon was a slum, easy money for people who knew which one's a push, which triggers a pull. Does the Kampak Tao have anything to do with this? The Japanese inspector eyed him, a strange glint his, on his face. He gave Lam a wry smile. Mr. Kozem, you signed up to follow orders and not to question them. Your badge and uniform that you are wearing, that is an insignia of protection given to you by the state. Hope that you have not forgotten your orientation sessions. The inspector turned to leave. The whole room arose and left with him. Badge, gun, uniform. <clears throat> All that allowed them to see the soul of the pearls. Cool. Well, localization, and of course we read the civil service ordinance, which we'll get to that one, but we also want to do some of this. Um, decrease corruption by one and a half, two percent. Let's do this one first. A man from North Point composed a letter to his parents from the outsk city outskirts, asking for financial aid. He appealed, Baba, laugh in Shenzhen is terrible. I leave home at six in the morning and come back at ten in the evening. I clean messes people leave behind, and I get paid trinkets for honest work while boss smokes opium and pocket bribes in his office. After paying the mailman's tea money, he cut open the brown envelope containing the reply. I'll spell bank notes worth several thousand yen in a letter. Flipping it open, he read, Get a better job, we didn't raise a street sweeper. Bobby wrote in his own response later, later that month, I'm a clerk in the government house. At least they pay street sweepers pe uh, prisoner pensions. <coughs> or they pay, they pay them pensions. Our civil servants overworked and underpaid, and so jaded they make punchlines out of themselves in private. Is there any one of them become an inside men for corporations willing to pay the rent? This must change, says the chief executive. Nice. Well, we have 10 days left. Green political power and must expat uh, some government support, 12.5%. 90, 85% is not bad. Ooh, 10 days been removed though. Ooh. <clears throat> is there anything for 5 days? 10% quality, 10 days. Or we can just rush it out right now. Five days for even more political power. Is that worth it though? For 25 political power, you get 5% more increase in quality and quantity. Even though it's not as it was worth it, we'll still do that one for now too. And then we're done with this one for now. So 90% and 95%, that's pretty good. And doesn't lower support at all from anybody. I'd say that's pretty good overall. Now we've got to focus more on corruption. <clears throat> Full localization. Ooh. Are we we're almost capped there, are we? Or are we already capped? Eighty seven percent. Oh, we're almost capped. We're still close to being capped. Eighty six and hundred percent. Nice. So now with that, we're at forty six percent. Onwards and upwards. <clears throat> Lamb heard the commotion well before he knew what happened, as he returned to the, from a beat to the cheers and clapping of colleagues, held around the radius in the center of the bullpen. Did you hear it, Han Su? A fellow officer hurried over against a shoulder, whispering, uh, <clears throat> whispering conspiratorially into his ear. Starting tomorrow, the employment restrictions are being lifted. The Japanese lieutenants are crapping themselves. The lamp stopped in his tracks, digesting the news. Finally responded, good. That's not all. Li uh, Quan Ha, you know, the captain appointed by Li Kaxing, is formally putting his name to become a deputy commissioner. <clears throat> what of us, deputy commissioner? The lamp shrugged weakly. Do you think he has a chance? Um, his colleagues slapped him on the back with Chief Executive Morita and Lee Kaxing on the selection committee. Maybe we'll get into a fair hearing. It's better than anything else we've had. As his colleagues walked away, Lam walked back to his desk, fishing out a set of papers uh, stored neatly in a drawer. He read over the extra once more and cleaned as Japanese he could manage and then made for the stairs. My future is my own. So, a couple comments from the last video that include I think when you choose the main market of Guangdong State's annual key technology product sales, uh, choose multiple markets rather than one. It's true that if you choose a Chinese or Japanese market, it does not matter because those two markets are large and fertile. Choose other markets such as Italy and the other secondary powers. You should choose multiple markets at the same time because they generally bring lower benefits than the Japanese and Chinese markets. You try, this person tried to sell in all markets from China, Japan, and all the markets. It was success, successful. It really brought in tremendous benefits. Can you actually do select more than one?
So we did choose the other one. You can only choose one at a time. Can you? Yeah. Now it's just a Brazil. We choose all of them. <clears throat> Grass is Nanjing. Uh. Yeah, no, you can only choose one at a time, it looks like. Well, okay. Um, so also, it says, uh, the most difficult thing when playing the Guangdong stage ruling, uh, ruling direction of Soli. It's only its allied government's holding power only to the extent of having a weak coalition between 40 to 50 percent of the government. While the, the other remaining three corporations are almost opposed to reforming radical ideas of Sony's allies, making the implementation of the radical vision of Sony or President Morita Akeo is very difficult due to the opposition. While Sony is difficult to have achieving absolute power in the government quells opposition, make Sony's reform plan use some dirty methods to succeed. So it says, uh, I need to immediately really get corruption under control. Once we finish buying dignity in the air we breathe and reach the quagmires of tomorrow, I recommend you do the housing crisis. Though the language question will be up to you. Though this person favors the trust core, which we're not going to go with, we're going to go to the other core. The committee of the Chinese labor, that'll be important later on. Oh. Okay, well, uh, yeah. I obviously, I've not gone down the exact path that this person has recommended, but that's close. Yeah, I don't know, and we'll try to... So now, we're going to Chile. The Triton Color TV. The best thing to acknowledge for color TV has existed for years. <clears throat> The bears obstacles have stood in the way of this widespread adoption, namely poor picture quality and small resolutions. <coughs> but with the launch of Sony's latest product, the Triton, uh, Trinitron, Tr Trinitron, Trinitron, color TV may finally have its moment. Using aperture masking technology, the Trinitron is able to show full color to much higher fidelity and greater size than ever before. The blowing the competition out of the water, both picture quality and screen size, and a press of 13 inches. The Trinitron stands to bring the magic of Technicolor into the world's living rooms, into the wonderful world of color. Increases her seats by three. Get part of the cycle. Pretty good overall. 46. We need four more votes. I don't want any more corruption, though. It's already so freaking high. A little piece of Guangdong. The soul was sitting behind the Andes Mountains. Our Thoreau fumbled with his keys as he looked, locked up his store, a secret smile across his face. If he knew a few more days of business like this, he might be able to keep this store afloat. It all started when the government began an effort to sell TVs to the campaign to improve Chilean lives. Soon everyone wanted a TV, and every store in the nation was competing for that sale, from the largest of retailers to humble Ar Radio Arturo. But Arturo had a trick up his sleeve, something the department stores couldn't touch. When the government drive was announced, he had already bought a shipment of Sony's. Now they were flying off of the shelves. It was as if every man in Santiago was rushing to radio Arturo as each was buying the same thing. Arturo turned to stare at his uh, te uh, display television. A Sony, of course. It was remarkable to the extent to which the Chinese Chileans admired that machine. Its picture quality was certainly remarkable, but Arturo knew things were never quite that simple. Perhaps it was simply the legend of it. The mystique. This product had been shipped from, the, from some far-off province of China. A land only known for the quality of its goods now could sit in your living room. Even a man like Arturo was transfixed. Growth, not enough. Only 40 billion. Inflation's already 5%, which is not good, actually. But overall, not bad. Just... I don't want to water down anything, so... We'll see when we do this one. Investing in human capital as well. Which we need to do, too. Audit senior officers. Increases corruption. Increases corruption. Um, extend the senior bonuses. And it's a sort of a counterintuitive logic that would make the chief executives more zealous allies balk out of the principal and thrift. Let the senior executives pocket more of the government's money and they might not pocket the companies in exchange for papers. Men expect little change from men with long histories of scandal and grift. Moody thinks otherwise. Lloyd is a pulse that drives Guangdong. Money stimulates its jewels like electricity. Carefully applied money, conjunction with punishments under the worst examples. Um, well, signal to the government's privilege that their employer desires their loyalty more than Matsushita, Hitachi, or Fujitsu. So far. Hiroshi Yamauchi sat comfortably in his office in Nintendo's headquarters in Guangdong, reading through the various documents he had been given to him. The sound of pleasant music filled the room as he found himself smiling at the latest report that had been given. Nintendo's profits have been risen significantly. Gambling profits are up and demand for various gaming equipment has risen. Nintendo was given an opportunity for Sony and Chong Kong, and it fought tooth and notice he's at all. The deals with them and Stanley Ho were a godsend for both Nintendo and Yamauchi, who found himself extremely pleased with the results of all the hard work he and his company had been given to get this far in such a volatile market. From barely scraping by with a meager existence and equally as meager instant rise, to rubbing shores with some of Guangdong's biggest companies and being a rising star on the market. But of course, decadence and complacency is what leads to ruin. Yamauchi knew this full well as he got to the second half of the report detailed the success of Nintendo's venture in electronics. That is to say, a disappointing failure that quickly soured his mood. But just as the harsh reality of a new venture got him down, Yamauchi's spirit was once again raised by the realization that he even had a new venture to begin with. He was steadfast, determined uh, that he would strive for further success and stability, and his spirit boasted by all the hardships he had to face in order to obtain the success he had today. How will he play next? A just reward. 
Lamb, Al Sun. I, the desk of two of his colleagues, with some suspicion. The two men, who have been notorious in this department for the corruption of themselves and their positions cleared out of the building over the weekend with notice, notice was, no notice whatsoever. No trace of the existence remain. Even their nameplates have been ground to pieces and thrown into the garbage. The Marini government's new corruption campaign seem to be proceeding apace, and Lem worried about the work, amount of work he'd been forced to take on as a corrupt good for nothings who are supposed to get it done got cleared out. As he thought about how to cope with the possibility of new, new Russia work, his new subordinate, Chan Kai Kui, came back and saluted him. Ah, see you on our boss. Just said that I'm getting a raise. Apparently the higher-ups are impressed by the work I put in that one Kowloon robbery case. Do you want me to come and get to you get you too? It seems that you'll be eating a raise as well. <clears throat> as Lem nodded and got up, followed by Chan, he looked back at the empty desks next to him and realized that Miss Yasukawa's were probably right. Those idiots' wages were probably being diverted to his wallet, not that not that he minded. <clears throat> Better with him than with them, he thought. So, overall, not bad. Um, there was one we did, a, a China Opinion one off-screen, but that was the same one we read, I think, earlier in the campaign. So, I think... I sure did that before, but uh, I tried it and we lost 3% Chinese approval, but not much we could do. Protecting Masushita's interests. A visit from Masushita was always enough to make Morita apprehensive. A visit from Masushita, in which he promised good news, was enough to make Morita want to crawl under his desk. But here he was, shifting awkwardly in his chair as Masushita entered his office. When he took the seat, Morita pointed him to Masushita began his proposal with a charm of smile. <clears throat> I won't miss words. I know you have a proposal coming up the Council to Reform the Civil Service. I know you don't have the votes to pass it up right now. Matsushita's uh, smile widened as he saw Morita's eyes narrow. I'm willing to give you those votes. In exchange, uh, he produced him another folder and laid it on Morita's desk for these concessions. Morita examined the contents of the folder. Matsushita picked out several of his own people to fill new key positions in the Civil Service that will be opened up if the bill passed. Morita considered, on the one hand, it was for glad handing. Naked corruption that stood against everything he believed in. On the other hand, he really didn't need those votes. Adds amendment, Matsushita's interest... Uh, Given exclusive rights to the civil service. Ooh. Um, we can always come back and reload it just in case. I want to see what Hitachi and Hujitsu have to offer first. 1952, part one. Summertime walk, gleaming neon suns and striking color against the backdrop of the stars. The city shutters struck carrying rocks and sand striped by the pavements. Water ran down the side of the buildings, flowed smoothly into the drains, washing away the graffiti and soapy foam. Scaffolding cl clambered along to the concrete and steel frames of prospective factories, department stores, bursts of arc welders flare, and was away in long instants. A soft rain patterned the seam, the wind blew seaward. Shivering in his coat, Lamps shook his cigarette off his back, lit it, dragged it languidly, drinking the air and smog as it congealed into the city's breath, drawing it in and out. Another day at the station, he entered the precinct and hung his coat at the nearby hangar. The air felt a little stale, a familiar sensation after a year of being on the force. He was a sergeant now, positioned in the Brussels with new responsibilities. A fresh, fresh face, Chinese recruits from the, the Up River turned in, up in his squad. So green, much too young to see the face of other face of the province. This evening, after his patrols, he had to give a present, presentation to these people. First, there was a vagaries of policemanship, squatters, construction, hazards, license, and the basics of handling those matters easy stuff. <coughs> the next subject was quite a lot harder. Heuristics and logic, intuition and investigative sense. Just like in Sherlock Holmes, he said, detective work requires a certain capacity of deduction in your part. Once you've been there at the scene, gathered up the evidence, sent them to the processing, and did your paperwork, there it is. A pattern emerges. You question yourself, you question your partners, you call up the witnesses of a ring what little emerges. Once the thread passes through the eye of the needle, everything is easier. Thread the pattern, apprehend the correct suspects, solve the case. A younger policeman gave a little applause and then a faint smile in return. All of them were Chinese. That was indisputable. Beyond that bond of loyalty and appreciation, however, loomed the shape of something greater, something even more ineffable yet tang tang tangibly sharp. What was it? For what is change in man but the price of time? The price of time. Oh, the French are still in civil war, huh? The plan leaks. Uh, let's see. Murray enters off to find Lee Kishin standing over his desk holding a newspaper. Have you seen this, Akeo said? Murray shook his head, take the newspaper from Lee's hand. The headline read, Murita plans to purge Japanese from Guangdong government. She below, in small text, was Leko outrage. Murita blood turned ice. How did it, how the press back in Japan got a hold of this? And purge? All it was trying to do is make the government better reflect the people it served. This wasn't some kind of tyrannical power play. What can we do about it? Lee asked. Lee looked down and said, the way I see it, we have two options. We can reroute out the bill to implement the reforms more slowly, let the Japanese bureaucrats get phased out more naturally. That should keep Letko off her back, but we mean betraying the local Zujim, who we promised new openings in the civil service too. We also just stick to our guns and hope the media and politicians in Japan find in some new scandal to pontificate about, Shika said. So you can put us in a robot, what do you think of Kale? Well, that doesn't help us out at all. Slower, slower rolling out effect. The provisions of the bill will be gradually phased in to the benefit of the Japanese expats at the expense of the Zujim. I'll give it Guangdong, not them. So I'll we'll have probably a problem with the Lion, lion Rock Spirit. Well, I'm Guangdong's not easy. It's better best efforts. Um, in an atmosphere of province prioritized above all else, of course. Well, I'm not reading this one now. 
There's only so much we can ask from the collective effort of the highest levels, but what competition is the way of life. We've taken the first step to show the people that the government can and will provide an opportunity for a better life. We will offer solidarity to the people of the Earth's nation. Now we call upon the people to persevere to direct their energies from civil survival to prosperity. Oh, we certainly need to extend senior businesses and into the ranks. The first thing that, uh, <clears throat> the separate of the Guangdong police force from the triads, uh, what was they say was that the citizens who paid taxes so the former can rob them out of the house and home. The second was that they wore blue khaki shorts. Stanley Ho's boys dressed themselves smarter, see? Under Sony Spank new management, however, Commissioner Omori will have to decide if the bone system has been skimmed off Lego's coast coffers is worth the people's lack of trust. Maybe we'll get rid of the stupid shorts while he's at, while he's there. Uh, maybe not this time. Well, maybe not this time. But you know what? We're going to go back and double check. The Civil Service Ordinance does pass. The Civil Service Ordinance that at least partially integrated the bureaucratic apparatus of Guangdong and passed its originators, Lily Kishing and the Chief Executive Marita Kao, were ecstatic. Marita's on cloud nine as the votes were counting came out in his favor. As a certain delegate cheered, Lee came up behind him, slapped his back, and said in Japanese with an earshot of a microphone, It's a big effing deal. Marita smiled in joy, but as Lee continued on with what he was saying, Marita looked at his opponent. Kamai silently stood up and laughed, but his focus was on his former friend and worst enemy, Ibuka Masaru, who was fuming after having spent the last speech trying to invade into the delay, giving Zujin and the Chinese a voice. This too pleased him. Whether it was angering Ibuka or getting praise from Lee meant more to him that was unclear. Lee was beyond ecstatic. Chun Kong's corner of the leg co was out of their seats, jumping and uh, cheering in joy. We walked up from Reed and said, This is a big effing deal. Okay, we pulled it off. We're finally doing something good for the people. Marita smiled and nodded, but Lee noticed that his attention was divided. We saw that Marita's focus was on his hated enemy. He smirked and nodded his understanding. We can talk about the fine points later. So basically, I gave in to Matsushita. We still have a 69% uh, corruption, which we're going to try to work on getting down, but unfortunately, we do give Matsushita one more leg co seat, which does suck, but honestly, like, if we have too many seats, anyways, the corruption thing is just going to hit us again. We're going to lose seats too. So, um, we increase Zujin and Chinese government support, more admin efficiency, get more Chinese, uh, Chinese appro approval, um, decrease Japan's approval. So, it is what it is. So now they have 26. And we still have 33. We still have a, still a decent amount. So, um, but we're going to do this one to cut down stuff too. Hmm. But next, investing in human capital will be followed up with that one. Confront him. Also, we do have over here the two new hype, but uh, the police are now dominant across Guangdong. So we get more monthly government support, uh, more opinion cap, as well as the Chinese Zhujian assimilation rate, which is pretty decent. <laughs> in the aftermath of the passage of the Civil Service Ordinance, uh, Hayashi Kosen received the promotion which he had dreamt for so long. Granted, it was not all sunshine and rainbows on his first days in the job. The Japanese majority among the more senior officers made their distrust clear. There were insinuations and snide comments about him being merely a diversity hire and unfit for the job, and once or twice he could have sworn that a slur or two was being uttered behind his back. But all that rubbish mattered li very little to him for two reasons. First, he was used to being slurred left and right. Second, for all that he did not show up, this promotion had him just as much on cloud nine as Marita himself had apparently been when the ordinance was passed. The next day, a second uh, on the job, he met with Yasukawa Yushiko wearing his new badge. I talked about the Lego's flaps du jour and the Lego in the Guangdong High Society. They moved on in the streets of Koshu for the usual rounds. As the escort has charged around and kept order in the streets, Ko Sam felt for the first time that he wanted to do his job exactly right. Uh, the feeling intensified the next day, with the superior granted him responsibility over his own patrol unit effective immediately. Now Kozen was really eager. Perhaps he could start, at last start making a difference. A well deserved promotion. Nice. We're looking very good now. Minus all the corruption, which... We'll do the best we can. You know, there's no guarantee. We do get over almost roughly 1.9 political power every single day. Um, we're kind of... Stop looking at this so much, which we'll probably still do this one to help keep boosting up this group here, but that's pretty much it for now. But having the police dominate is very good too. Happy December, everybody. And we're still trying to finish up a cup of coffee here. As you can tell, this video is definitely longer than the other ones just because, like, technically the temperature recording there is going to be a hot fix coming out soon, so yeah. 1.25, 1.92, that's a very high for Yakuza influence. Uh, extend senior bonuses, but we're going to go in here and start looking at this one as well. Investing in human capital, a frank conversation. Uh, Shimoda Takeo was angry about the bonus he had received. The senior bureaucrat conferred with each other of his colleagues and found that his nominal superior, the man he knew as Ri uh, Kasai, was the one responsible for the period of bonuses. So he went to the man's office and Koshi to complain, for that some reason, Ryu actually, Li Kushin, had been expecting him. Li courteously uh, ushered him into a chair and asked what he wanted to discuss. Shimoda took the opportunity to make his complaint. Mr. Ri, I'm here to come. I beg your pardon and request a reconsideration of my bonus. It's far lower than I deserve given my long and diligent service to the city of Guangdong. Moreover, it's also far too small compared to, what, to both what I used to receive in previous years and what people around me, especially the Chinese Zhujin, are receiving. I worry, sir, that ethnicity might be playing a role in how you consider these things. Lee smirked. 
She might have turned paler as more words came out of his boss's mouth. Your complaint is noted, but I'm aware of another important fact that expensive vacation you took to Kyoto, Naro, the Jingu at Ise, to how much did it cost, and all those souvenirs and lucky artifacts you brought back from the Jingu and about 15 other temples to give to the people, how much did they go for? I'm told you had senior priests, bless them, and even Chinese like me knows that that ain't cheap. But now Shimoto was pale as the papers he worked on, but Lee raised his hand. Extravagance isn't a crime, and you won't be fired for this. But if you want that kind of extravagance, you best earn it fair and square. If somebody else wants to pay you, Mr. Shimoto, you're free to work for them officially, but the government only interested in rewarding the loyal, common employees, and you better think about that. Shimoto realized that Lee had a point. He nodded directly. I, I, I will. So now, the housing crisis. we we'll focus on the houses. We have 49 seats, which is very good. Tackling the housing crisis will be face that is being faced by the bottom line. Increase the Chung Kong's initial support for the ordinance, which is good. Build the bed towns. Got to be, be more centralized. Uh, increase administration, cause more poverty. Pumping power progress. Versus the schooling shortage. Maruda argues that education Guangdong will forever be condemned to poverty, which is very true too. We have 60 seats for this one though. You can build houses and give them stuff. Or you can teach them how to read themselves and make themselves better. Tackle the education crisis that's hampered Guangdong's development. Increase the Sony's initial support for the thing. A literate workforce is a more educated workforce so they can actually read and do better. Because you can just give them all this stuff, but if they give them the education to do so, they can build their own houses, do their own plumbing, power and progress, and stuff like that. Let's go to the schooling shortage. Between the low literacy rates and even lower levels of technical competence, much of our large population are simply unproductive. For Marita, ensuring that the populace becomes educated and literate is absolute requirement for, or for Guangdong, along with Sony and Chong Kong, to grow to their fullest potential. Yeah, I think that's probably better overall. I like this one, but like, this one's obviously better. Down to the docks by Riverside Pier is boxes of heroin, boxes of cocaine, pot high, yum. Guns, mostly old C-96 and wartime Nampa pistols, laying rope outside the list of drugs. Japanese officers on the scene, minutes uh, earlier, Sergeant Lam Halasyon, arrived on the scene on the patrol wagon, the red and blue flashed and immediately into the warehouse, of which the Japanese now hauled workers and clerks. Hands off me, a captain his worker said, throwing off the grip off a Japanese police officer who held him. The officer was not plus in the response. He drew his gun. <clears throat> I said, he shouted above the dead of the sirens, that you are under arrest. Now move along if you don't want your brains all over the floor. The sound of the firearm did little to terrify the worker, who popped his chest as if daring the officer to shoot. They had right between them. Stop, he said. Stop, he said again. This time, Japanese. He turned to the Japanese officer. I'll handle this. In one fluid motion, Lamb shoved the worker away from him and spun him around, a swift click of the handcuffs falling shortly after. He read the worker's rights twice, once in Cantonese and one in Japanese. <coughs> After hauling the Gerson worker to the patrol wagon, he joined the circle of police detectives who surrounded the evidence. That's a mess, the inspector said, dark circles underneath of his eyes. Kilograms of illicit drugs, a host of guns, and works. It's a crisis. He wiped the sweat from his brow. Witnesses uncooperative. We have no leads. Not necessarily, Lamb found himself saying. He was unsurprised. We can get manifest from of recent deliveries to this warehouse from the clerks. We wanted to try and see if the patterns turn up. Memories flashed before his eyes. There's one hole in our net. Rural Guangdong, unpolice. Wild in lieu of evidence. We should look there first. Sons and nods. The inspector looked at him. I appreciate it more, uh, uh, Officer Hayashi, if neither you or your fellow officers speak out a term. The shock of anger ran through Lamb's fist, but he let go. And dignity is a privilege of the oppressed, not the oppressor. Not great, but not bad. The surplus is looking better, though. Even though debt to the GB is going up, and inflation is very high. Ah, good. Corruption is where? 0.34% every month. Academic check. Do we pass 41.86 billion? Oh my god, yes, we did. Hey, that's looking better now, which is good. Negative 1.94, so we really going to try to focus on corruption from here on out. Police are still dominant. And I think the next one we'll do up here, if we possibly can, I think it probably be best. This is going to be difficult to do, but we're going to do a Shokan for more uh, police support. So, But it is December, and basically it's January now. <coughs> which means... We gotta start thinking about the next year's product cycle and all the other crap that we're gonna do to get everything done and finished. <coughs> Excuse me. I keep coughing and sneezing in this video. I don't know what's wrong with me. The death of the Tsar. Well, the crest is not earlier, too. Fine, skilled labor. Lane, uh, Lee Kashing and Morito Akeo sat down to discuss the latest problem, bedeviling both their companies. A shortage of skilled la local labor. As the vast majority of Japanese university graduates that might apply to be. Uh, to join one of the major companies, Guangdong, and shows, and said Matsushita or Fujitsu, so did Chung Kong, said invested the resources and training people on the job, while personally reaching out to promising candidates in order to stay competitive. But as Marita said, this ain't sus sustainable. Especially not if we want to grow and outflank the competition. Either way, we need people trained to do the job, directly finance, or by giving the people the savings they need to send their kids to school. Have you got any suggestions, Kashin? 
And he smirked. Yes, I've got the thing. Let's provide public education and public housing to the Zhujian, and more importantly, the Chinese. Nobody else is going to do it, so we'll have to. We'll have to. Best of all, people know just what to do and who to thank. <clears throat> Moody's eyes widened. Don't you know how much this could cost us? Lee smiled conspiratorially. There's no need to cost. For to cost all of that much personally, if we're ever clever about how we rebate the cost, or for that matter, how we set businesses up. Um, a lot of comprehension drawn on Morita's eyes, and his life's, uh, lips curled into a smile. That's a darn good idea, Kashin. Go prosperity sphere. We're actually underneath them, so. Machuko is just, it's just dropped. Are we max? Yeah, we're maxed good. Oh, come on. Bruh. I want to go higher. 140 days is going to be faster than we know it. Um, we could do this one again, maybe. Chinese workers. I want to meet Chinese representatives. Let's see what. Let's see. Let's try that one more time. It might be good. It might be not be good. You know, you never know. But this has been a fun campaign so far. I've really enjoyed this. Now we gotta get ready for the oil crisis too. But the Chinese should be really representative of us, right? Right. A literate workforce. Literacy is not just ability to read and write. It's an understanding of the signals used to live in a civilized life. Think of how much time is spent explaining to our workers what a lathe is, or simply how to use a typewriter. A uh, waste of time means a waste of money. Basic literacy across Guangdong will make our lives infinitely easier in the long run. Even if educating the populace will be costly. The most irritating man in the world. The only positive that came with the meeting Zong Zi Guang, Morito Kiao decided, was that he wasn't Wang Ji Zhu. Beyond that, there was a little that made him appreciate these meetings. It was unfair to the Consul General, the man is an annoying dude, and he really gets under the scam, but at least he was trying it for an honest cause. Many men in Guangdong did worse deeds for worse reasons, Morito. Okay, would even caught himself respecting the man from time to time, much to his dismay. Not at the specific moment, though. There was very little that kept him from reaching over the desk and strangling the glass-wearing diplomat. Fugitives were the issue again. How he hated, hated, hated fugitives. How he hated the slimy bureaucrat from across from him. The red who delighted in harboring the enemies of the state. He was talking now, the little dude. I understand your frustration, Chief Executive of the Man began. The very tone of his words were like nails on a chalkboard, however. There are procedures to interstate extraditions. I need to consult my legal staff to review the concordance with Chinese laws, then refer the matters to Nanjing and wait for the response. I'm sorry, Chief Executive, but my hands are tied. <clears throat> They're right across the border, both you and I know this, Marita the Chaos Heath. If simply arrest and return them, this whole escapade could end in 30 minutes, and you and I could never speak again. The Consul General smiled. That would be very simple, yes, but the laws of the sovereign states must be respected, and Guangdong is a sovereign state, is it not? Of course it is. Gosh dang it. <coughs> We're still down here. My god, just end the frickin' war. Hey, good job, RFK. I kind of want to get involved again, but I don't, I don't really want to. One point six is very nice. Not bad, my friends. As we just finished the, the coffee that we have for this entire campaign, or not, oh, not campaign, but this video. A precious youngster, a precocious youngster, not precious, but yep, precocious. Li Chun watched his younger brother Hei due to machinery while looking at the schematics and manuals Chun and the father brought home. As the boy poured over the technical documents, so he made more interesting points to build it up upon those he had been making clear for weeks. To Chun, as to the rest of his family, it was quite clear. Hei would benefit from more schooling, but clearly that was a forlorn hope. And part of the Koshu where they lived, only remotely good schools catered only to Japanese and one or two wealthy Zhujian families. Moreover, what few Chinese schools existed would be of little use for Hei, who needed access to better resources, and they taught only basic sums, literacy, and obedience to the state. That basic curriculum bore even why. She too had talked with her mother and father to see if she could get uh, get more and been Chris following when they, they expected no came. As hey, continue looking at the diagrams, copying them down and making more precious observations, Chun could not bring himself to puncture his beloved younger brother's enthusiasm. He did not say that this was likely the upper limit of what someone could realistically hope for in the secure city. A light hidden under a brush serves no purpose, and engineering scholarships. There's a name for men who detest waste while ignoring t waste of town. Extol the virtues of hard work while telling subordinates and ask parents. The hard work just won't cut it. The court of public opinion can't decide the better between hypocrite and plaster saint, but they unanimously agree Grand Dong is full of them, especially in the halls where licenses and diplomas are made. Sunni and Chong Kong have made their own work and money cut out for them with Guangdong's literati uh, refuse to seek out the brightest among the Zhujian and native Chinese, but that just means they get more of these bright young men working for them when they graduate, no? What else do we have here? 61, my god! So stratify with public, you lose political power, get more stability, which helps with political power. Policy costs goes up, but more taxable population, more academic based change, and facilities research monthly change is getting get more of Sunni seat. For call nineteen fifty three. After a long day spent meeting the suppliers and customers, Li Kishing blinked as his eyes adjusted to the room of his, to the gloom of his factory. The radiated heat from the few rows of machinery matched the monkey heat outside, his plaster was liquefied to be poured into molds and painted by hand, creating artificial flowers and internal bloom. 
Even as the workers started to leave, Lee walked into the back room to sit opposite Morita Akeo, reflecting ab Abacus, sitting in great cover coveralls while under the lethargic spin of a ceiling fan. I don't know what you were doing. I don't know we were doing so well, Lee said, peering over Morita's numbers, startlingly high. Are you sure? It's not, Marita tried to reply in Cantonese before switching to Japanese. He sent the flowers to the cost of producing the other things. The other thing uh, Lee understood was Marita's transistor radio prototype, sitting in a teal plastic case of Lee's design. It was a pro product of hours of trial and error, promising him more than simple survival. Marita bowed his head, dejected. Even if we sold everything for President Lee, it wouldn't be enough. The reality of business was stark, and the Japanese had no sympathy for the black uh, list of Marita, and even less for Lee, which left, I could reach out to. No, Marita said weakly, no gangsters. What happens when we fail? A short silence fell over the two, broken only by Lee's reply. What do we have to lose? Continue cracking down on it. 1952 Part 3. Downtown Chaozhou, uh, downpour of the, off the walls, down the pavements, and into the drains, hammering it on the roofs. The shop fronts and the ponchos of police officers tasked with sweeping the low-rise buildings and warehouses. Lamb directed officers to set up checkpoints at crossroads and junctures. Large ways were struck against electric lights. Despite the dramatic nature of the operation, <coughs> the work was quite mundane. A squad approached the building and radioed their progress and usually would return a negative response. Cruising in his patrol car, Lamb passed by the house that faced southwards towards the sea. Rainwater slid down the slope of the gabled roof, the window dark. Where did it all go wrong so, so long ago? A creative warmth forever denied to him, standing low and stout against the rain and the gale. Those days were no more. As he rounded the corner leading down slope and away from that house, he spotted a few figures that scampered away at his approach. The building that lay beside where he once stood had made the had the make of a warehouse, large, two-storied, and a truck parked itself in front of what Lamb surmised was a transport gate. He raided his squad, an unmarked warehouse near the old house just down the street, he said to the receiver. Around the corner, you won't miss it. I'm going in, out. Wait for backup, the reply set, hacking his way through. Ignoring the message, Lamb put the receiver back into the slot and walked out of the car, flashing light in his left hand. He checked the truck. Crates of guns, bags of cocaine and heroin. Intriguing. He let himself in through the ajar door beside the building. Oh. Um... Stacks of guns, stacks of drugs. In the middle of it all, a silk spinner. A bolt of silk and his spooks. Spokes. Ooh. At the periphery of the scene, Lamb saw the silhouette of a man whose back was turned against him. Freeze, Lamb said in Cantonese. Put your hands above your head and make no sudden movements. The figure I did as he was told. Now turn to face me, slowly. No sudden movements. Lamb knew that the figure was familiar. He'd seen that building somewhere before. <clears throat> ah, Tan, he said, tempering his shock in his voice. What are you doing here? Friends of yesteryear, foes of the new age. 1969, economic review. So, how do we do? Three more seats, see? We've actually got three more seats. Increase to Japan's approval of 5%. We need uh, expect a real growth of 11%. Four, almost 48 billion. Seventy-eight percent huh? Captain 95. Alright. Not bad. We'll see what we can do. But yeah, that's looking very good. Very, very good. So, uh, as I said earlier, like the, the uh, one of the commenters from the last week said, it recommends the building the houses. But I'm like, but, 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 as I, I do want to reduce poverty too. Public housing would be nice, but yeah, increasing, getting better poverty stuff here. I mean, we, we would have had the seats eventually, but yeah, I don't know, schooling. I mean, it just makes sense to get schooling too. Giant support, Zujin support. We're gonna get Chinese and Zuzhin support and academic administrative office. Now we're doing both those. Here's that one too. Human capital advancement ordinance. <coughs> nice. Hey, look at this. That stain is finally gone. Once again, I don't know how we keep getting these stains, but we got them again. Cool. An education we deserve. Why am I doing this again? The lamb grumbled as an aging patrol car rattled on the gravel road and now we're outside Koshu. It was unusual for the Koshu police to have anything to do outside the city and with a passenger, no less. I'm sorry, Yosukawa Yoshiko ventured uneasily, stealing a glance at Lamb's rapidly darkening expression. We're riding with the schools and I needed an escort. On a day off, Lamb rolled his eyes. He resisted the urge to snap. It's like you people own the place, because it was true, not an insult. The dude disembarked silently 30 minutes later, outside of some bleached wooden schoolhouse, with Guangdong's tatter flag on the roof. We're not for the sight of children uh, through painless windows. The building looked as if it should be abandoned or condemned. Yoshiko hesitated, eyes widening, before she walked gingerly across the dusty grounds. Lamb followed wordlessly, having witnessed too many familiar scenes to be surprised. 
And so the two ex exhausted teachers faced a hundred pupils. Their uniforms often patched, frayed, and a size too small. The books were torn, the chalk was broken, and the desks were wobbled and creaked. For every eager good child, six more were listless, and unengaged by torn books and weary educators, but still preferring school over an empty home. Those children deserve better off, Sir Yoshiko's pain of admission as they got back in the car, of something so blindly obvious, if one were not naive, I'll have a leap. Lamp without suspicions bend and snap. Have you been paying attention to anything, Miss Yasukawa? Lamp said, as he calmly as he dared. To you people, this is all we deserve. The ride back was silent. Human Capital Advancement or Ordinance. The office of the chief executive has done much to better the fortunes of Guangdong's people since uh, Murchis' ascension. Minimum wage, work hours, safety standards, and health care, all these and more were bettered under the Sony CEO's fastuitous watch. Monumental change and with an effortless signature. Progress came relatively easy thanks to his position's wide range of powers, and yet the very same powers can undo his work just as easily as once wielded by an unscrupulous successor. Once, not if. At the end of things, Murray is the only man with his dreams. Guangdong is adept at grinding both to nothing. Consortiums of men, on the other hand, equal parts wealth and political acumen are costly to uproot. Thus, Hoshio signs such men as stewards, secretaries of his many legacies in health, welfare, housing, education, and others, and that they and their new offices will remain, maintain them long after he, he no, no longer can. We have 134 political power, which is unusually high. What's wrong with us? We're working on getting this back up because even though I do, do remember it, I did cut it down a lot earlier. Hiring teachers. With the massive expansion of Guangdong's public education system, the government is once again faced with a choice. We expand our hiring of local teachers. They will be able to teach a curriculum better suited to the immediate needs of the communities. And the Chinese and Zuzhin or students may find it easier to engage with lessons that are taught by teachers that have the same background as them. We can serve as a role models and inspirations to succeed, however. Recruiting from the local population might be difficult because of the very problem we're trying to fix. The general lack of access to education in Guangdong. As likely that expanding a force of local teachers will require a lowering of the hiring standards, accepting people who are not strictly qualified and attempting to train them on the job. The way around the problem would be to take the other approach, bring in teachers from uh, Japan to supplement our existing force of native teachers. The advantages to this are obvious. Japan is overall much more educated than Guangdong, so finding fully qualified personnel will not be a problem. And with these more qualified teachers, the improvements to the modern education system will be able to proceed faster and more efficiently. Our goal is to build an education system that matches the prestiges of Japan's. Why not hire the very people who currently manage the system we aim to imitate? This plan is not without its own drawbacks. Native students may find it harder to learn from foreign instructors, and it may be ingrained in their minds that education is not for them, but the Japanese privilege. Local communities. As amendment. Our teachers will be locals from Guangdong. Hired from Japan. Should still have enough seats, right? Yeah, still 60. The challengers. Uh, oh, God, no. We have 50 total seats. Bruh. That's so stupid. A worthy story. So now where are we at? Are we still at 60? Really? I don't know, Yasukawa, editor Takasaki said hesitantly, tapping Yoshiko's hands draft with a red pen. Our readers are looking for letter reading. Everyone there, everything in there is real, Yoshiko countered. You wanted to capture the rhythm of life in Guangdong, but this is it. It only took in hours for Yoshiko to write the draft on her visit to the dilapidated school. It was scant on statistics and light on levity, pulling back the corrections on the visible neglect and education outside the Three Pearls. It was an unvarnished look outside the bustling cities where the Japanese and wealthy Zuzhen lived, pretending that the other people lived no differently than they did. <clears throat> I don't know, Takasaki repeated, sucking ear through his teeth. Our readers want to learn, but they also want to believe, you know, the Pan-Asian Brotherhood and all that. If you ask me, Editor Takasaki, the Pan-Asian dream isn't working. Yoshiko pressed her point home. Not for these children. Our readers deserve to hear what, that in their own words. Takasaki was silent. His fingers drove in the desk as the ceiling fan whirled in the background. Yoshiko tr tried another approach. At the very least, it would be difficult. Or different from what we, from the weeklies from Tokyo will be saying. We can't go wrong with being original. At that, Takasaki gave a weak chuckle. I circled the article's title, I sent them to be published, and I handed the draft back to Yoshiko with a parting thought. You're starting to sound like a Yoko Yasukawa. One of the comments says, you can exchange Chinese and Japanese support for political power. I know we can. I know I did that before, but at this point, <clears throat> I think we're okay. Come on, product cycle. Two months. Telling the truth. There's no escape on the subject du jour of Guangdong's Japanese enclaves following the release of the Kantan Fujin Korn's latest issue. Uh, the several executives and their preening wives and a few mistresses denounced it as this low screed, a fabrication. Some of their juniors and younger housewives joined them, others nodded along politely, but few said nothing, their faces pale and drawn, for better or for worse. Everyone had an opinion about Yoshiko's expose, and for a journalist there was no greater compliment. There's just one thing left to do. So Lamb opened, having been called under the Koran's offices directly, no interviews today. None, Yoshiko confirmed, what's done is done. You guys one heck of a ruckus, that's for sure, Lamb said, <clears throat> nodding a cigarette. Uh... Uh, don't get your hopes up. Whatever the chief executive or what his kind says, you can't take him at face value. Why not, Yoshiko asked, leaning against the police cruiser alongside Lam. Chief Executive Morita and Lee Kishin's histories. They're nothing like the rest of the suits in the government complex. One got run out of Japan, the other never finished school. That They mean what they say. Lam grunted indifferently, but was otherwise silent. He gazed up at the clouded sky. Do you think they'll succeed? 
Yoshiko shrugged. I don't know, but I'm telling my, the truth. But if telling my truth can make the difference, then I did my part. Scenes from Underworld 1. Bruh. That's so... No. Get back here, you piece of crap. Come on. Reforms. Thank God we can do these more reforms. It costs so much, but I'm proud to do this. I know, before Li Hei. Or Li Hai's, or Hei's, school with teacher, Mr. Wong, looked over the latest mathematics test. But I have no errors. He wrote the customary 100 with two lines under on the top of the front page. And as always, Wong knew it was richly deserved. The teacher knew, as everyone else in the school did, that young Hei knew his business. The little genius was ever clever enough to accurately draw machines and copy out schematics from memory while finishing his tests well ahead of time and acing them to boot. Wong side of the tragedy of it all, of course. Though it galled him beyond belief, he just knew how useless the education he was paid to provide was, uh, what, how was, how uh, poor it was. The likelihood was that poor Hay, just like so many smart children had, had come before him. So little chance of having a good future, no matter whether he stayed at the school or went to the other myriad shabby schools with Chinese and Guangdong. But his bitter thoughts were interrupted by something catching his eyes. It was the front page of a Sony brochure. Sony scholarship offer. As a contest on industrial processes and the factory in the future, applications welcome. That was worth a shot, Wong thought. He was up to bring it up to Hay the next day. He said yes. Hi, Hay. Yes. Trains. Scholarship distribution. Or the door opens wider. It was another day. Another boring day, Li Hei thought, as he stared out the window of the bleak Koshu landscape. Suddenly something changed. Mr. Wong uh, was calling to him in the faculty room. He liked Mr. Wong, so he had no problem with it, though he was worried about whether he might be in trouble. When Hei got to the faculty room, he found two men in suits waiting for him, and Mr. Wong smiling somewhat nervously in the corner. The men, both wearing Sony lapel pins, smiled benevolently. And one of the masters in Cantonese, your master Li Hei, I presume? Hei suddenly somewhat nervous nodded. The man smiled and put out a document that Hay recognized was his essay from earlier. Young master, would you kindly walk through this essay of yours with us? Hay nodded, but he had something to say first. Sirs, I'm not sure what you can do about what I'm going to tell you. Everyone says I'm smart, and that may be true, but my older brother, I admire him so much, is still smarter. He can do numbers, watch more than just a machine, but the people at his job must have him doing tasks that a machine could be doing. The man nodded. We'll look into him then, but let's get on with the essay. Hay nodded and began to discuss his work. Fujitsu's offer. <clears throat> When a secretary told him there was a letter from him from Fujitsu, all Murdit could do was sigh. It was sure to be another accusation by Ibuka that was leading the country to ruin. But when he sat down to read it, Morito was surprised to find that it was not a personal message that from Ibuka at all. And so it was written professionally, with no name attached, only the financial officers of Fujitsu Limited. The letter was a proposal, one that took the surprisingly positive tone of the government's recent reform initiatives given its pro progeny. Uh, the letter proposed that in order to aid the government's efforts to make university education more accessible, Fujitsu would be allowed to directly sponsor promising students in technical and research fields, funding their education, and offering them a job when they graduate. It was a tempting offer, pushing some of the cost of scholarship for low income students onto private companies, while letting the burden on the state budget, and would give the new students guaranteed employment upon graduation. Murito was almost floored by how civic minded it all seemed, but he quickly saw Fujitsu's angle. It would give them a pick of the litter of Guangdong's new generation of skilled laborers, which could prove a major leg up in the coming years. Did he really want to give such an advantage to Ibuka of all people, but still the benefits could not be ignored. Ignore the letter. Adds the amendment. And pick promising suits for their own company. Nope. Scholarship distribution. Murdered upon a letter in his hand. There was a notice from several concerned corporate citizens about his government's new scholarship initiative. The letter said that while they, of course, recognized the need for the program, the benefits and the benefits of a skilled moral workforce will bring in the coming decades. They did, however, have concerns about the effect of the widespread distribution of these scholarships that could have on the prestige and reputation now enjoyed by the university system. So that prestige and reputation were being somewhat overstated, but Marita read on until he reached the list of names at the bottom. The open letter had circulated with a number of names attached. Mostly smaller firms, though it was almost certainly being backed by larger, more politically connected ones that preferred to leave their names off to preserve the image of the letter representing the concerns of the little guy. Murita, Murita pondered what to do with the letter. He could ignore and let the program proceed his plan, giving out as many scholarships as he could, getting running, starting on the building of new generation of Guangdong's workforce, highly skilled and able to compete in an increasingly technical world economy. <coughs> and of course, the more parents who saw the children be able to go to college, the more goodwill this government could build with, build with the people. But the people's goodwill is not necessarily the most viable in Guangdong, and perhaps he would be better off getting the goodwill of the companies behind this letter. And perhaps their concerns were right. He could stand to make the programs more targeted without losing its impact. Proceed his plan. Oh, go with the wide scholarships, the benefit of the Chinese, the expense of the Japanese expats. Make the change request in the letter. Um, they had more Chung Kong seats, but that does hurt us. But it shouldn't hurt us that badly in the end. Let's say just in case, like we normally do. We still have 57 votes. Nice. Increase the chance approval again. 
Even more giants approval. And Paru also begin to slowly improve as well. 1952, part 4. Why are you doing this, Lamb said, holding his revolver level to uh, Tan Center Mass. There's, I could ask you the same of you, Anton shot back. I have nothing to say to you, Japanese slave. What do I, what do, I do? I do for our people. The tribes would provide for us. They're only our, they're our only salvation. Can't you see those around you, or did they make you blind, Officer Lamb? The rain hammered the warehouse's roof, filling the sounds with a rapid staccato rhythm. Adrenaline thundered in Lamb's head. Fishes of energy pulsated through his veins. Give up, he said finally. Give up. Give up all of this up. Turn yourself in. I'll speak for your character. I'd rather a Chinese dog speak for me, uh, Tan smirked, and not a Japanese one. A shot rang out from the second story of the building, and a bullet whizzed past Lamb's ear, missing him by inches. He dove for cover, letting his reflexes do the thinking for him. Splinters of wood burst as he ducked his head and ran under the cover of the boxes. Sparks flew as hot lead dashed against the gun metal. Lamb shot back blindly amid the noise. Scream, screams. Guangdong police, a voice said from the far away. Come out with your hands up. Silence and gunfire. Lamb blinked the blood away from his eyes. The last thing he saw was a silk spinning machine as a bullet struck it. Snapped in the silk threads, the wheel rolled back, back, and back. And it, on it went, rolling and rolling till the world was bleak and there was no escape. Still four and a half. The door opens yet wider. Uh, Lee Chun was called away from the factory floor at the Chung Kong owned factory. True, their job was better than his old job had been, but they had not been able to advance beyond the level he'd reached at that old pest hole. Despite that, he was dissatisfied to be called away and made it visible on his face as he went into the meeting room. Two work men were sitting here, both sewing lapels in the suits, and Lee noted spoke in Cantonese despite having a distinctly Japanese look to them. One of them spoke, Mr. Lee Chun, I presume. At least curtain nod, the man continued, You, Mr. Lee, are lucky to have a younger brother that looks out for you. Lee was bemused. I know he looks out for me, sir, but how do you know that? The man smiled, looked through this essay that young master Lee Hay wrote for essay competition, and see if he recognized the conclusions. Lee read through it and was flabbergasted with the depth of his younger brother's ingenuity. I, I do recognize the conclusions. I've been told by shift manager things to this effect, but nobody listens to me. Both men nodded. I see your talent is wasted here for all Chung Kong's merits. What do you say to working at a Sony plant instead as a foreman? We can arrange a substitute for the young master's education, too. That'll make sure he can really shine. This was his and Lee Hay's big break. He knew it. I'm in, sir. And Matsushita's proposal. A visit from representatives of the Matsushita Electric didn't arouse quite much as unease in Morita as a letter from Fujitsu, but only buried. Was informed that they wished to discuss a recent education reform, he knew pretty well what they were going to say. After Secretary waved the two men into his office, they laid out their offer, as expected. A substantially similar to the one from Fujitsu. They would sponsor the education of prominent young people and hire, and hire them after graduation. This, the one difference was that their explicit demand would be an exclusive arrangement. That was bold, and Matsushita was clearly hoping that Morita would consider him the least bad of the major conglomerates and prefer giving this benefit to him over any others. Morita considered the proposal. Much as he was loath to admit it, Matsushita was right about him being the best available in partnerships. But was it worth giving him such a large advantage in the new Guangdong? You got a deal? Nope. Not at all. Have they made any progress? Just what measures in the go. For Hitachi? Just what we would want, right? Just what we would want. Hey, advancements in audio video technology. Happy May, everybody. Now we've got to start fighting for the product release again. Anyone know where the play button is on this thing? Honestly, for this one, we might just go with China next. Let's, uh, okay, we'll put a political power. We'll this one. Yeah, why not? We'll sell the China next. Why not? Cool. Blinded by victory. As the thunderous applause and heckling jeers engulfed the legislative council chambers, Lee quietly scrutinized the faces of the other tycoons in attendance. And uh, fleeting moments after a vote, they had often let the full degree of their emotion surface, valuable information for the next round in the ring. Marita, of course, was making no effort to hide his elation, laughing heartily and clapping mildly. Matsushita was clapping politely, the model of corporate poli polities, even in the moment of his own government success. And what of the po opposition? Kamai wasn't much different than before the vote, alternating between braying about the wastefulness of the proposal and fuming caustically in the seat. He'd been doing more of the latter ever since it became clear that the vote was turning against him. Ibuka was as quiet as Matsushita, his face as impassive as Matsushita's, his hands clapping slowly before he gathered his entourage to leave. Not seeing Ibuka arm in arm with Kamai was surprising enough, but Lee could swear he looked almost uh, uh, accepting of his, the outcome. Look at Ibuka run, tail between his legs, Marita crowed. All that talk about us bringing Guangdong down in medi mediocrity, only for us to pull everyone upwards instead. It serves him right. A chaos, Lee intoned, measuring his words. Shouldn't we be more worried about Komai? Ibuka doesn't seem too bothered by the vote, but Komai is against us on principle. We're just saying nothing, and suddenly gloating about his victory. So, a kind of be more centralized, it would get an education focus. Increases our seats by one. Poverty will begin to slowly improve. We get just more benefits for everybody. Except Japan. Screw Japan, sometimes. Looking relatively decently here. 
And I'm in efficiency. We'll go from a deficient administration to over here. So we actually get more a lot more things here, which is really nice. Line rock spirit. If you want to do this again, please go ahead, but that's great. It's really great. So then we're done with this part too, then. Nice. Just figuring it all out, my friends. Beautiful. 10%. Surplus is not as good as it was, but whatever. And inflation is a little further down too, but it's nice. Um, did I read into the ranks? Yeah. Yeah, we read this one earlier, so we do that one too. I do want to cut down on the Yakuza too. Wait the, wait the truck's through. Calorate some vices. Well, we'll probably do this one next. Sure, we'll do that one. Why not? I don't want to just spend political power willy nilly, but we gain the product cycle between 15% and still on 60%. Okay, so between 0 and 60, like I said earlier, now it's 15 and 60. That's very good. Um, I kind of really want to sell to the Chinese market. Get more opinion, give more support. Profitability is not that great, though. Hmm. I'm going to have to sell the Chinese. Japanese is okay. Maybe? And we can save and just continue doing all those again and whatnot, so. Uh, yeah, for now. Yeah, not bad. What do we got up here? Oh, happy G now. Five percent, four percent, three percent, four percent, roughly here. Almost seventeen percent. Not bad. Fifteen percent, seventy-seven point five, huh? Quality, 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 quality. Beautiful. Lion Rock Spirit. And into the ranks. So we got mm, well, three quarters of the tree done. So I'm gonna do folks on corruption stuff. An independent commission. Oh wow, look at all this. Um, increases level of corruption, basic training with combat schooling. Is that military professionalism change? Professional as a police? Sang Guang Dong, you have three people to turn to when your neighbors make a ruckus. First is the Camp Pai Tao, who will charge an unwashed uh, Chinese an arm and a leg for breaking the public peace. Second is your loan shark, who will charge you an arm and a leg, so will send his goons to break your neighbors. If you have either Camp Pai Tao or loan sharks, nor loan sharks, only then you'll call the police for us, because a cop will charge your arm and leg so he'll visit your neighbor, then charge him his, his arm and leg so he'll do nothing and leave. Jokes aren't made out for the police's expenses for no good reason. And what good is the force they say is only used as a leech's last resort? Trust between the uniform and the people it's sworn to protect must be established before the camp by tag gets too accustomed to enforcing Guangdong's laws as they've interpreted. <clears throat> the world half fool. The line of the rare su sunlit day floated in through the blinds of Marita's corporate office in Hong Kong Central. Uh, suffusing uh, the space and warmth beneath his office. A thousand people in suits, high, high neck chungasms, chungsams, both playing intricate and rags and tatter pa pantaloons, milled about the pan pan majestic fountains in the square, even as Camp Pai guards warded them away from the brownstone facade of the government complex. Do you think they understand what we do up here? Read of you, Sid Lee. Was marking up a man random at Marika's desk. Do you think, do you, do you, they're listening to us? Do you think they're listening to us? If you're talking about Ibuka and Ikomai, well, they aren't going to listen to us to begin with, Lee replied, but we put them on notice that they'll break, that they're breaking the law now. Ignorance isn't an, ex an excuse. Hmm. Marita didn't turn away from the window, staring at the teeming crowd below. Uh, Akeo, Lee side, saying his work aside. Law's law. Only this time the law's working for everyone down there, not just for uh, uh, us, or for the two of us up here. I can tell my children that they have a chance of a better future, and so does everyone else. Side by side, we'll overcome all these ills. Anything else here really we want? Not yet. Because right now I just want to look at this. Cap. Crease. Awesome. We're actually looking very good right now, and it's, nothing's bad is going to happen at all. We need more product quality, though. We've got a lot of profitability. Quality, quality, quality. You know what? It's only 5%, we could probably afford it. I don't want to do this one, even though it's very, very good. Uh, force, please. Prototyping? Probably not. I can test. Uh, which one's Koshu again? Oh, uh, we could probably sacrifice it maybe a little bit. Maybe. Jokoi. 
But that's more corruption, so we're not even going to do that song. Uh, quality, interest. Well, we're going to at least do this one, so. I think we're on the episode there, because it's gone all long enough. Almost two hours, so if you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. See you tomorrow, when we're probably going to end up in a crisis after we we're just going to start slamming down, destroying, hopefully, as much corruption as possible. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.